You're on mute, Mr. Wiley. You're on mute. You start again. Thank you everybody for, for your indulgence. I'm sorry I had to step out for a moment. I'd like to um, call our meeting to order. It is 5.35 p.m. on um, April 14th. We do have a quorum and I'd like to take our, our role at this time. So let me start with uh, Ms. Pat. Yeah. Welcome, thank you for being here. Ms. Ferreira. Here. Thank you as well, Mr. Vernon Jones. Here. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones, for being here. Ms. Owen. Here. Thank you. Ms. Walker. Here. Welcome. Thank you. Mr. Cage. Here. Welcome. Thank you. Ms. Bowman. Here. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. And welcome. So here we are. And welcome to uh, those in our community who are tuned into our meeting and uh, logged in to be with us this evening. Welcome to you as well. Um, uh, very quickly, we're going to go through. Um, I believe what I'd like to do this evening is uh, suspend the approval of the, the and review of the minutes of the of the two twenty four and uh, three three um, agendas. Um, for this time and go right to those at the next meeting. But that is always our first order of business, but given what we have before us and the time frames we have, I'd like to defer those to our next meeting. We're going to, um, as we always do, go to public comment and I will open the floor to members of our uh, community safety working group for any lead commentary they have relative to our work from their individual experiences followed by our action and discussion items, which uh, will consist of this evening of our consultant uh, discussion, which would, will typically be uh, an update from Seven Generations Movement Collective, uh, the consultant group was working with us. And then we will return to a conversation about the uh, community responders, which we, we must have as, as a group. And after that, we will look at upcoming events, set our next meeting date, and see if there are any topics that didn't, that need to be discussed that were not presented in 48 hours to the chair before this meeting, and then we'll go to an adjournment. So again, thank you for all for being here this evening. And you know, given that, I'd like to go straight to our um, our reports and comments. And uh, I'd like to open it up for public comment. And Ms. Uh, Ms. Moyston will recognize those in our community outside the primary group who would like to make a comment at this time. At this time, no one has their hands raised. Yeah, you know, just wait a second more to see There are any. Okay, not, not seeing any at this time. I want to thank you all who are attendees to the meeting for being here. And we'd like to move forward. And I'd like to open it up to our uh, community safety working group members for any uh, uh, updates, uh, opening comments that they would uh, like to make at this time before we get into our action and discussion items. So to the group. Ms. Ferreira. Yeah, I just wanna make a quick comment. You know, obviously uh, another uh, life has been lost out in the Minnesota area, um, close by where the trial is happening. No, very frustrating, just, you know, just so difficult to yet again, you know, get that, that place. Um, and of course we're having conversations at home, you know, with my kids and they're all, you know, startled, just afraid as we all are, right? Parents, community members and all of that. So reminding us again about how critical it is, uh, the work that we're doing and really making sure that it's, you know, 
work that's going to be revolutionary and uh, longstanding and, and cause longstanding change, um, you know, in the community because it's much needed. And I think a lot of people are, lo are losing faith, you know, that something is gonna, is gonna change. Um, I did look at one of the um, information that I think, I don't, I'm not sure who sent it, uh, maybe community members or, or what have you around the East Hampton report. Um, I thought it was interesting and it, 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 you know, I didn't read the report because it's, I guess, 115 pages, um, but um, did say about, you know, investing in non-police community-led responses to safety and health concerns, you know, kind of going around, you know, the same vein that we're looking on. And obviously we're looking at things beyond crap too, other recommendations that we have on there. But everything else seemed kind of like, um, I mean, I'll say kind of run in the mill would be the word that I would say, but, um, you know, and, and it seemed like they did have some members on the, on the team, on the group that ended up leaving because they weren't happy with how things were progressing. Um, so, you know, so obviously I know that, you know, when you're doing this type of work, it's not easy and, and you know, we all need to be, you know, strong and kind of focused in terms of, of what needs to be done here. Um, but I am going to, you know, I do want to kind of look further into their um, report and see what else uh, they came up with. But I thought that that was interesting. Thank you, Ms. Ferrer. Other comments, Ms. Mr. Vernon Jones? <clears throat> I just wanted to echo what Deborah said about how deeply painful it is to have to face yet another police killing of a black man. Uh, and it does underline the importance of what we're doing. Um, and I wanted to report that Ms. Pat and I did meet with the executive directors of the BID and the chamber uh, and um, the uh, chamber director brought along uh, the um, Kayam, who runs uh, Global Cuts in South Amherst, and uh, Dr. D. Shabazz joined us as well from Seven Generation. Uh, and I think it was a very fruitful discussion, and uh, I would summarize it saying they would like to be supportive of our work. Um, Ms. Pat, is, I don't know what you would like to share with the group about it. So, um... First of all, I want to also echo what um, Ms. Ferrara said about the events of this week as a Black parent. It has not been easy um, not to call my kids to tell them I love them. Uh, you never know to appreciate life every single day. It's just exhausting. I'm very tired this week. That's how I'm feeling, trying to pick myself up, but it's been very difficult to have young lives, lots like that. So uh, in terms of the meeting we had yesterday, I thought it was very productive from my perspective. It was a robust uh, discussion. And um, for, for the chamber and uh, bed rep, um, for them to trust us to, you know, to speak, um, from truth, you know, was very helpful rather than being defensive. So, mm -hmm. and also Kayam, uh, the, the, the owner of Global Cut, uh, to have uh, a representative for, from Bicop community was really nice too. And of course with Dr. D being there. So we, I thought we had, I'm very hopeful about the chamber and bed. There's a lot of work to do there um, I think we started the conversation yesterday. So we'll see how it goes. Basically what they are recommending is to have more police officers on the street. That's what they're, they're pushing for. Um, I don't wanna go into details of you know, what they're saying in downtown Amherst in particular, but that's what they're recommending. But they're open to you know, other alternative public safety, and they would very much like to, they're hoping that would be an easy phone number beside 911 because people are used to 
calling 911. If we can come up with alternative phone number people can call, that's really easy to remember. It will be good. But overall, you know, I liked it. Mm. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones, Ms. Ferreira, Ms. Pat, uh, other members of our um, working group. I have a comment myself, but I'll defer to the, the last spot on the comment list unless someone else has something they want to say. <clears throat> okay, I'm not seeing any hands on the screen and I, I uh, thank you all for your comments. I, not to repeat, but I, I do want to echo what was said by the, our first three members of our working group. And for me, as a, who, uh, someone who identifies as African American, who's been living in this community since 82, and have been through a number of different experiences over the years, both in Connecticut and here, to to see the events unfold at this time uh, over and over again is extremely difficult for me. And uh, it, it, it takes a lot to, to bring energy to, to these kinds of meetings to do this kind of work. And uh, so there's a lot more preparation besides just reading documents and, and spreadsheets and those kinds of things, but there's a preparation that, that has to be made uh, spiritually and emotionally, which I'm doing and, and I'm here, but just want to acknowledge how, how viscerally painful this has been for, for me. And um, as I say that, I, I want us all to be able to take that in, but also get to a place where we don't forget those kinds of things but that we put ourselves in a place where we can uh, begin to innovate and, and, and activate and um, be the messengers that we need to be at this particular time. Um, I, I am 71 years old right now and I've seen this. Thank you, Ms. Pat. I don't know what that applause meant, but thank you anyway, but I, I I, I have seen this over many years as, as, as a black person and a black male in particular in this country. And so uh, I just wanna say it takes a lot of energy for people like me to come to this kind of work, but it also drives this kind of work. And I, and I hope we can, as I sometimes term it, I don't know how good it is, not sort of fall in love with the problem, but address the problem directly. And I think our, our issue today and every day as a committee is to put something on the table that says we are the messengers, we know what the message is and we need to put it forward and um, you know, do the best we can with that particular piece of it and keep moving forward. I, I would hope that we um, bring our emotions with us, but not, not, not let us, uh, not let it invade our, our purpose and what we have to do. So um, I appreciate everyone's comments and I do see one more hand from Ms. Bowman. And I, I think after Ms. Bowman's comment, unless there's others, we will we'll move forward to our, our, our agenda and welcome our consultant, Ms. Bowman. Right back, but don't wait for me. Hi. Um, oh, I have to take my hand out. Right. I'll figure that out in a moment. Um, so I, I missed some of that because I was getting Benji into the car. Um, so I missed everybody's comments basically. Um, but I did catch a little bit and I just wanted to say that I am actually not watching the trial and actually really trying to stay away from anything having to do with the trial in particular. Um, and really staying like I thought that after we elected a new president I'd be okay with being on you know getting on and watching the news again and I can't still can't do that um and it's a lot it's it's really mentally taxing um and unfortunately like 
like I really, I'm really having, like I'm really having, like this is my hardest day out of the week um, because it's so emotionally taxing. Um, and I, having lived in Amherst for 30 years, like I, um, I just, I, I hate to say it, but it's like, I really have a hard time having confidence in this process. And I'm trying to really like be here and be open for it. Um, but as a woman of color who has seven boys, um, six of which are children of color or not, they're not all children, some of them are adults. Like I walk with a lot, with a, with a heavy, a lot of fear. I walk with a lot of fear. I walk and I, and at first I didn't walk with fear when they were home, but you know, and then we had the incident with my old, my eldest. So now I walk with fear when they're home. Um, and so that's why I'm here. And that's why I'm trying to stick this through because I really, I really need to push for, I really want to be here to push for change to happen. Even if I don't end up staying in the area for one reason or another, like I want this next generation that's coming up to not have to deal with a lot of the same things that I watched my kids have to go through or that I went through when I was in, you know, go, when I was a, a youth here. And, you know, it's so it's, I just wanted to put that out there, there that, you know, there's a, I've had a lot of emotion when it comes to this, because I feel like one of the things that I feel like, and yes, I'm generalizing, but Amherst as a whole has done is really disappointed me when it comes to issues that directly affect the BIPOC community. Um, they, have, I really feel like time has been like, time has been wasted a lot. And I know Ms. Pat had talked about that before, about other committees that have been put together that, you know, we're supposed to be doing progress. And, and, and that's what, you know, and I think a lot of you have gotten, uh, have understood that about me, that I'm really fearful that, that this is gonna just be another one of those like situations, you know, where, you know, there's, things don't go through. Um, and that, and I feel like that actually is really like, especially when we're working on a committee like that, and then things don't go through. I feel like that's really disrespectful to everybody in the committee when there's no actual intent behind making this, making the, you know, let actually having that committee or working, what I'm trying to say is working um, towards the goal of that, com com the committee or towards, um, or taking the committee's recommendations or whatever the case may be regarding that committee. Like it, I just really feel like it's really disrespectful to like take up people's time. And I know that's happened many, many times. So I think that's where a lot of my frustration comes on top of, you know, getting little whims of the next black person who's been killed, the next black person who's been killed, the next black person who's been killed by the hands of police. So that's just, I just wanted to like put that out there. Like, this is really, this is like, this is a lot. This is a lot. And, and I'm trying to do self-care outside of this to, to deal with that because, you know, my, my emotions are everywhere because any one of those, those people who have lost their lives could have been my children, you know? So it's like, yeah, I'm frustrated. So anyways, but I'm here. I'm here and I'm trying to be positive. So that's all I have to say. I will be silent now for a little bit. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Bowman. And, and you know, I, I hope that and you didn't hear the other comments, but I think it mirrored some of what you just said from uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Vernon Jones, Ms., Ms. Pat. Um, Ms. Ferreira and myself, I, I think it echoed a lot of what you just said. And I'm, uh, I'm hoping we can reserve some energy as, as a group to take some of this pain and anguish and turn it into, uh, turn it into purpose. 
And I, that's, that, that's, what, that's what we need to do. And although that is very hard and difficult, uh, many of us are used to hard and difficult. So I, I hope we're not dissuaded uh, or discouraged by any of that kind of challenge being put before us and that we continue to move forward. I just wanna say as chair, I, I, mean, I appreciate everyone's efforts in, at this moment. And before I just move on to welcome our, our consultant group, I do wanna thank as always, you know, Ms. Moisten for dealing with this group every week. We are, are putting a lot of effort forward. And, uh, and so thank you, Ms. Moisten. I, I also wanna reach out to Ms. Uh, Mr. Bachelman, you know, it's, this is not the only like group he has to pay attention to in, in the town. So I want to thank you, Mr. Bachelman, too, for your communication with us. I want to thank you for sending that uh, the uh, uh, the link to the video where you did your presentation. It was very helpful to me and probably to others. Thank you for the other information you sent to us regarding um, what you're, you're thinking around some of the, the the, the financial issues related to what our proposals might become. So I know this takes extra work and I wanna thank you for it because it gives us the kind of uh, information that we need to move forward. And uh, we, we wanna respect that and honor it. And I, you know, when we get into the discussion of the, of the Crest proposal, I'm sure many of us will really wanna interact with you around that. So I will go forward with that. So uh, Ms. Moisten, and then we'll move to our agenda. Mm -hmm. So first, I just want to say, um, you guys know I love working with this group, and um, I hope that we do get to make some some real um, changes that impact. But I also want to let you know that um, I know that we skipped over the public comment because at the moment, no one had their hand raised. Right. But Mr. Um, Vince O'Connor is here and has his hand raised. So I just wanted to alert you to that. Okay. Um... That was my final comment. I'd be happy to return to Ms. Mr. O'Connor if he we could welcome his comment. I I I want to I want to hear what what he has to say as well as the committee, as as a working group. So if we could take a couple of minutes, Mr. O, you can welcome him for a few minutes, and then we need to move forward. There are people waiting to uh, present. Um. So is this a appropriate time to make a comment? Yes. Okay. So, um, yeah, I, I too was, I, I don't have television, so I don't see any of this stuff, thank God. And um, as a person who, you know, took in a black male child that when he was between his junior and senior year in in high school and who has left us after seven years last August, I, you know, I had lots of fears and there were nights when I just wished that he would come home. <laughs> and uh, so I, uh, I think I want to say that I think it is important for the committee to articulate that the policing function of in the United States is basically the genesis of that function was both racist, misogynist, and homophobic. Without and but to make an important distinction between the nature of the institution and the people who who are participants in the institution, because I think there is a difference. But unless we can see the institution as a problem without attacking the individuals who are currently members of the institution, I think we're going to have trouble convincing the public that the institution is a problem. I, I do think that in addition to the larger um, concern of the committee, I hope the committee will um, do, do you know make some concrete suggestions for policing not you know uh, I believe in abolishing the department and having it an armed force and an unarmed force serve under someone who's a member of, ne of neither but I do think it is important to 
for example, to make it clear to the police chief and to the town manager, the city manager, that they have to have a plan because there is there is in a Minnesota suburb a a town a a city manager and a police chief who are out of their jobs because over the space of a single day they mishandled the situation and even though this is Amherst and people say it will never happen here that is the very attitude that leads to this type of a of of poor management of a situation that shouldn't have happened um and two people lost their jobs very quickly um and i so that kind of a suggestion they have to have a plan and they have to know what they would do if there was a if if a situation even approaching this happened and also secondly i think that we need a rule saying nothing encourages the police to make disproportionate stops of black and latino people more than the than the thought that if they stop x number of people they will find somebody with an outstanding warrant and quite frankly i do not believe that as a result of a traffic stop any outstanding warrant should be enforced upon a driver or anyone in the vehicle the traffic stop should should be a traffic stop for whatever and there should be no warrant enforcement because this is what encourages the police to abuse their authority to target people of color with traffic stops and um and i think that whether we have to do it at the state level or we have to have it be a directive of the town government or the city government um it this is the kind of thing that will discourage um the misuse and bu- abuse of traffic stops which have led to all these tragic and horrific situations um so um i i you know please you know whatever the charge was which i have not seen in writing don't don't stop at the words this 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 country is in a situation where every intelligent organized thought about where to go needs to be put in writing at every level of government um to really convince people that this this institution of policing has to be um radically transformed in the same way that Harry Truman radically transformed the US military by his executive order of the late of the late 40s it is that kind of a transformation that needs to happen and it unfortunately is only going to happen at every level where there is a police department and we should make our contribution however small it may seem to be Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you Ms. Moyson for inviting Mr. O'Connor in and and Mr. O'Connor and other members of the community, I would welcome you to stay to listen to our conversations and be further informed by our work and uh want to thank you for our contributions. I'd like to move very quickly to welcoming uh uh Dr. Shabazz and uh Terry Mullen um into the group for their update and as we welcome them let's just make a welcoming comment thank you all for being here thank you both of you for being here and thank you for the work of the of the of the seven generations movement collective this is a uh, a very important time for us and um the information that you're gathering i'm sure is going to be very valuable to us as well as the the things that you're learning that can be shared with us in in the town of Amherst so i want to thank you for being here and uh spending time with us and weekly giving us an update 
just to, to let you know, we, we are going to be having conversations um, about community responders and potentially uh, conversations about oversight uh, beyond the, the tenure of this uh, community safety working group. So if you find it within your, your schedule and your time frame to stay with us through this conversation, we'd welcome your, uh, your presence to so you can hear our deliberations as well. So let me just stop there and welcome you and thank you. And I'll, I'll turn this over to uh, Dr. Shabazz. Welcome, Dr. Shabazz. Hello. Welcome, um, Terry Mullen. Thank you all for, um, uh, you know, just working, doing the work you're doing. I had the uh, privilege of being able to sit in uh, on the meeting with the chamber and the bid with Russ Vernon Jones and Miss Pat. And um, I found it really informative. Um, I'll, you know, I'm sure they'll share more with you, but um, I'll save my comments for the report uh, because I think uh, what they shared in terms of maybe what business owners are experiencing uh, around policing uh, is really helpful but also how they utilize policing. And um, that was uh, illuminating because they are assessing it not only as business owners, uh, but as people who are in uh, uh, experienced life as uh, white and privileged. And it's something that they uh, shared with us uh, in, a, in a very authentic way and um, there was a business owner who experienced his life as a, a, a black male uh, who also shared how he experiences policing and as a business owner. Uh, and also Miss Pat's years of experience as a business owner in Amherst and now in Hadley. So I think um, there's lots of, um, to parse out in terms of, of that information and how it might be used uh, to it advise, but certainly uh, Russ, uh, Dr. Russ Ferdinand Jones and Ms. Pat would be able to also share more about that. Um, to that end, we have uh, a draft for the part B of the research we have been working on. Just a bit of preface to that. Terry Mullen is leading this portion of uh, the project and Terry will uh, present the draft um, we have a, another researcher that we contracted with, um, very bright young person who's also been working on this. So three of us have been working on this. Uh, there's still uh, information that we are waiting on, particularly um, some of the people that I'm interviewing in the town uh, regarding services. Um, so that has yet to be fully uh, written up, but this is, it represents only a draft. So um, I think without further ado, why don't uh, I let Terry take it from here and then I'm sure we'll um, break for questions uh, that you all might have. Thank you. Um, so if it's all right with everyone, I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, oops. Uh, QLC outline introduction, history and context. Is that an affirmative? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Carrie, yeah. would, it, would it be possible to, you know, to make that just a bit, ooh, <laughs> a bit larger? That's great. That. I'm not that old, Terry. That's good. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate you, man. Uh, yeah. So, um, let's get there. yeah. So, this is just a, a draft um, of kind of what the goal is to cover. Um, so, specifically, uh, we look. We're looking at a bunch of review boards. Um, 
these four are kind of some of the more interesting ones. Um, Honolulu probably has one of the strongest physical power um, to do things. They can, they have full subpoena power, they can fire and um, I believe they're even involved in hiring the chief of police. Um, Cambridge is fairly old, currently defunct in some ways, um, but they are uh, seeking applications. Um, they should have received them at the end of March for, for their, their board. And they've been in service since 1984 um, with a decent amount of power. Um, Ithaca had very little power, but is hoping to flip to a much stronger, fully subpoena powered board. And then Oakland, similar to Honolulu, has full subpoena power and can also remove a chief of police. Um, we're going to go through the NACOL um, types of review boards um, for you all. Um, and I think with the review boards, the biggest questions that like basically need to be decided for Amherst um, is this idea of volunteer and not volunteer. Um, and will they be compensated positions? Um, will what type of training um, will be given to them? How will they be selected? Um, and so the details this week that we hope to flesh out are looking at the, the charter and looking at what type of legal um, things we have to our disposal and what things might need to change if, if uh, um, a uh, review board were to be put into place and how to make it effective. Because unfortunately, even though um, like Honolulu and Oakland have, and I believe Albuquerque is another good example, have kind of like the stronger types of review boards with some paid positions and staff support. Unfortunately, they are still getting a lot of, they're not very well trusted. They're not very effective in uh, yet in their, in their task of, um, I mean, really like you all were talking about at the beginning, um, just, that um, black men and women keep dying at the hands of police in ways that don't make sense um, to uh, as a way to make things safer or that that's not an effective way to to get this goal of public safety, which is what supposedly everyone's going for. So unfortunately, they don't these review boards. Um, don't seem to be doing uh, discouraging police misconduct in a in a measurable um, sense, but uh, yeah. So, kind of going into the theory of why that might not happen, and if uh, if there are things about Amherst, I mean, we're significantly smaller than those cities. Um, uh, as, a, as a member of the, uh, a group who went and listened to a lot of the police presentations this past summer, it seems we do have a um, police force who's interested in a civilian oversight board that's supposed to do a lot. Um, a good working relationship can go a long way. Um, so there might be some good things about that. But um, the main thing is kind of having, there's this idea in review boards that when they are only reactionary, like you get a complaint, you investigate the complaint. Um, and if they're understaffed and under-resourced, on top of that, there's not a ton that they can do. Um, whereas if they're more like the, um, investigators or um, doing more systemic audits or this administrative prosecutorial units, which is in out of the city of New York is the only one who's doing it. And so that's probably unattainable with our budget, but um, 
only then can you see like what's happening systemically and what uh, types of things that are going on uh, that may be uh, things like, for example, oftentimes um, disciplines are wiped from police records. Um, so if an officer commits uh, a misconduct that's deemed a misconduct, it will stay on their record for an X amount of time. And after that time, the slate's wiped clean. Um, if an auditor saw that maybe those officers continue after the slate, slate is wiped clean to um, struggle with misconduct, um, then that might be a place to look, review the contract or things like that. Um, and then you can make more systemic changes, but that really requires re um, resourcing and staff, which I think um, is definitely possible with some adjustments and then some um, uh, taking away from some of the uh, the police budget or from other places um, to bump that up. And kind of as I go through this, we'll kind of talk about some of the way, the reasons why that that might be effective um, in terms of the data that we've been seeing um, from the APD and from the call logs. Um, and I'll reference some of that. But I don't know if you want me to stop after each service. Would it help for uh, Terry to stop after each service? And then if you all have questions about that section, because it is rather dense. I, I, I would suggest that because as I'm sure like myself, I'm processing some of this information I'm hearing. I have a, I have sure. several questions, certainly um, some comments on it. I, you know, I don't want to occupy this, the, the time with that. But if we could stop, uh, Terry, and uh, take a moment to see if there are any reflections or questions from our our working group that we might want to put forward, whether for an immediate answer or for further discussion, that would be helpful to us. And, and let me preface that by thanking you for your, 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 your work on this as well. Absolutely, I'm very happy. I'd like to open it up to the, uh, to the working group. Uh, Ms. Owen. Terry, thank you so much for putting this together. Can you turn your volume up a little bit, unless it's me? Yeah, can you guys hear me better? A little bit. Okay, I'll just come close. Um, my, the question that, I, that I'm interested to learn more about is what type of proactive approaches are boards taking? And are these boards that are um, compensating people on their review board? Okay, if I could just, just stop there for a second. If, if, Terry, you heard that question, right? Yeah, what type of approaches are uh, proactive approaches are boards taking and are uh, boards compensated? Um, and are those proactive boards compensated for their 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 efforts? Thank or, you. I want to I want to just just scan our group to see if there are other questions we can put in right now that maybe you, you can collate these things in, in some way in, in, an, in an answer rather than one by one, that some of them might may overlap, I don't know, depending on what people have, but I'd like to open up the question uh, frame right now to, to our working group to see if in addition to Ms. Owen's question, there are other questions people wanna ask at this moment. Mr. Vernon Jones. I would just comment that uh, looking at our charge, we actually have until the end of June to work out the details of our recommendation here. But the big priority is uh, if we're going to have something happen in this area in the next year, what, what needs to be budgeted for it? Uh, so I'm particularly interested in um, what kind of training would be needed for people to serve on such a board. Um, I, I kind of wish we could get away from this term review board, which sort of emphasizes the reactive thing and think more of a civilian oversight board. 
and whether they're whether the members of the board are paid or volunteered, it seems to me they need to have funds to hire investigators uh, for some some complaints and issues. Um, Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. So if, if, if uh, uh, Terry, you can just put those two in the pocket for a moment, those two questions, Ms. Owens and uh, Mr. Vernon Jones's question. I have one, uh, I think, I, I can't see on your, your screen right now, but you mentioned uh, communities in Honolulu, uh, Cambridge, Ithaca, Oakland. The only thing that sounds familiar to me is Cambridge. So I'm wondering how Amherst might mirror some of what that community might be doing. Uh, I think we're looking toward uh, trying to see what is comparable, what is maybe parallel, and in addition to what is, a, what is being effective. But I don't know how long these Honolulu, Cambridge, Ithaca, Oakland, um, you know, the, these examples are in place and what the results are, but that would be important for us to know. And um, so let, let me leave it at that right now. So is there something comparable to Amherst based on what little we know about now, because we're still gathering information about Amherst through your work as to what we might be looking at. And if I, if I may just take a moment I think all of us on this committee, on, on this working group, are having a clearer and clearer and clearer as we go understanding of the history of policing in this country. That it, it, it is historically racist and, and oppressive. Okay. Whether it's Honolulu, Amherst, New Haven, where I came from, you know, no, no matter where it is, the, 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 the basis for this work has a, a racist and oppressive premise. So this is not, to me, doesn't go to people personally, certainly who are in the police force, but systemically it goes to them, if you see what I'm saying. So I, I'm trying to see like, trying to, I think that's what we're trying to carry forward. Like, how does this, how do we unravel this and as I focus on Cambridge, I'm trying to look at something that's closer to Amherst. Mm -hmm. Any other questions that you want to pose to, um, to Terry at this point, folks? Um, Ms. Ferreira. Um, I mean, I, um, before we move on, just clarify, uh, Mr. Wiley, your questions. Because you kind of had a big paragraph, and I just want to make sure I got them all down. Sorry that about okay? that, Terry. I have big paragraphs. No, I just want to make sure I got the good gist. So my question is basically, my question is basically, are are there, you know, I'm looking at Honolulu, Cambridge, Ithaca, and Oakland. Mm -hmm. The other stuff, stuff I put on is a, as a, a backdrop to this, but the closest comparison I can think to Amherst might be Cambridge. And I'm wondering if, as we look forward to this, are we looking at review? Can we look at review boards that that parallel Amherst as a community? Thank you for asking. Yeah, for yeah. No, thank you for for clarifying. Yeah, and I think someone had their hand up. I forget. Miss Pereira, thank you. Well, for me, my my question would, or I guess my ask would be to just kind of for you to continue down the line of the efficacy of these review boards. Uh, because I really, you know, in terms of us rec making recommendations, so I, I do want you to kind of focus on the ones that you said that have had some type of success, because for me, I'll be interested in that, um, because obviously if, the, if these review boards are ineffective to, to curtail police misconduct, then I wouldn't want to put my recommendation towards that. You know, I wouldn't want to put the limited budget that the, uh, uh, in resources that our town has to, towards a review board. I'd like to focus on something else. So I do, I'm very interested in focusing on, on, on that information, the efficacy of these uh, review boards. I would like to recognize Mr. Vernon Jones's comment. And then if there, if I could take a pause there to allow uh, Terry Mullen to kind of recalibrate and respond to the several questions that 
that they perceive. Mr. Bernard Jones. Yeah, I think one of the things that has made this community safety working group uh, a strong group is that it, uh, by design, has a majority of BIPOC membership. Uh, and so in reviewing the efficacy of these groups, uh, I'd like to know, are we looking at any that had majority BIPOC membership? Uh, and in making recommendations, I hope you will recommend that a majority of any such oversight commission in, in Amherst would be BIPOC because I am interested, of course, in changing police conduct, but I think we're also engaged in a bigger project of trying to transform for more power within the town to the BIPOC community. Uh, and it seems this, to give a majority BIPOC board real power and some control over the police department is a systemic change uh, that changes the power relationship of communities in the town and could be very important from that regard. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. And, and uh, okay, Ms. Ms., Ms. Pat, and then I'm going to go, go back to the top. You're on mute. Okay, I'm going to make my very uh, short. Um, Terry, thank you very much for putting this together. Um, in your research, um, did you find any of the boards that had to, that didn't have um, a police union in their community? I'm just curious to know about that. Okay, thank you, Ms. Pat. And let, let me just, let me cut off our questions right now because uh, I was responding to Dr. Shabazz's suggestion that we, we stop at a certain point and come back to allow you, uh, Terry, to, to comment as you're able and willing to at this point to the various questions we've, we've asked you. So uh, it, to ask to repeat those questions because I don't think we were able to do that, but anyway. <laughs> I got them all down. Um, so I'm sure you have it, so please, you respond to that segment and then we can move forward. Thank you. Awesome, yeah. Um, so most of them I will take um, with me. Um, so what type of proactive approaches from Ms. Owens um, and are those proactive boards compensated? Uh, based on the research, the more um, uh, quote unquote like uh, effective or um, I wanna be really exact. Um, I'll have to firm up the details, but it's my understanding from what I've research so far that the most effective boards are the ones who are compensated. Um, the proactive approaches, I'll have to come back to you on that. Um, Mr. Vernon Jones, um, as far as training and budget, I'll have to come back on specifics, um, but there is a wide variety of training available um, in, uh, under the N-A-C-O-L-E, um, NACOL um, Oversight Kind of Commission um, that's national. Uh, and then they also said, uh, there's also some investigators that are kind of built into the system in general um, in other agencies that might be able to help with this on like smaller levels. Um, Mr. Wiley, uh, to mirror Amherst, I actually think Ithaca is the closest in terms of demographics and understand uh, kind of, I mean, they operate on a county system, so they're slightly different um, in terms, and they have a mayor, uh, but other than that, their college town, they have very similar racial demographics. Um, they kind of end up in this semi-rural, semi-college town um, demographic. Cambridge is close in terms of under Massachusetts law, but it's um, just the amount of people um, is really quite different as I was reading about Cambridge and that they're a volunteer only review board, no compensation. I can't imagine finding, um, I just, I, I am having trouble personally, and I will also like 
go back to the research and and what I've been reading that I I would be nervous to recommend that just because of efficacy reasons and mm -hmm. just we don't have the population to um, find the volunteers. Uh, uh, and then Ms. Herrera, I completely agree the efficacy line is going to be the biggest part of this. Um, and I'll come back with more examples of kind of what pitfalls uh, these boards um, have run into. Um, Mr. Vernon Jones, I do think uh, majority BIPOC memberships, that's a good question. I will look into that. And uh, Ms. Onobaku, yes, uh, the union, the police union um, is my understanding that most police departments have some sort of union participation, um, but I will check to see if any boards didn't. Okay, I think that was everybody's. Thank you um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I don't know, do you want me to keep going? I focus mostly since you were talking about the responder models on like the cahoots. So that's where most of my um, kind of statistics and research uh, went into this week to get a more fleshed out um, kind of responder model. And I also don't wanna to take too much of y'all's time. Um, we do have two other sections after this. Um, so I don't know how you wanna do it. Well, we can come We can come back to that. I, I just wanna first thank you for that first uh, round of question answering. I realize these are in, in the moment and certainly um, stuff that you're close to or, or heavily involved in. So. Uh, we all appreciate the, the, the place you're at in terms of an, answering these, and I appreciate your responses. I, given, given the fact that you're here um, and you know, we, we want you to be a part of this meeting as much as possible, perhaps we can go on to the, the, the next piece of your uh, report, and then we can circle back if we need to, I think. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. So I focused a lot on the alternate responder models. So these are models like cahoots, where there's a van um, uh, that uh, can reroute a 911 call or um, and they can send uh, so uh, in Eugene, they send a social worker and an EMT mostly um, to people and they can kind of keep them out of oftentimes the biggest uh, kind of pro is that often these uh, interactions, these calls don't wind up going any further in the criminal justice system. So oftentimes arrests aren't made, um, the situation is handled, people are uh, given some services if those services are available um, and um, Kind of really just doing a uh, there's a different type of responding um, but so cahoots is kind of the first big one that everyone kind of goes to they were founded in 19. 89, which I'm sure you all have been researching this for a while as well, so I won't go too much in, involved in it, but they, they really ramped up throughout the years. They started very small, um, just one van, and, and then in 2015 was the last time I saw an expansion, and that's when after a um, case of two cases of uh, pre police uh, brutality or two cases of questions of police brutality, I guess, um, technically, um, were brought up um, because they were actually, they weren't operating 24 seven. Uh, they were closed from like 3 a.m. I think till eight in the morning. Um, and a few things happened during those hours. So they expanded to the uh, 24 seven option uh, in 20, uh, after 2015, so in 2016. Um, and then there's Denver with the STAR program, 
and they started in June 2020 with their um, pilot program from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, they focused on what they said was high-risk neighborhoods. Um, that's kind of a point of contention. Um, they were given uh, three million to uh, uh, expand the service uh, to 24 seven uh, just recently. Um, and it's in the first six months, they responded to 748 incidents, none required police or led to arrest or jail time, which is pretty impressive in my opinion. Um, so, and then what's also really good, I, what I really like from STAR is that they have plans to track further than just the initial police interaction, because as we know, this is the whole system, the whole criminal justice system is really being called into question as it should be, because um, we see the jail times and the court cases and the bail sets also are riddled with racism and oppressive natures. Um, so they're also going to be tracking that down, which is a very big task that I have tried before in the past to do for our area. And it's it's very near difficult, uh, but near impossible to track down what happens after the police interaction, after the arrest. Um, so basically, and I think this is what kind of we've been, or you all have been saying, and um, I may have been dancing around a bit, is the question that has not been answered by either CAHOOTS nor the STAR program is, do alternate responder models actually solve the problems that they set out to solve? Do they dec decrease fatal police interactions? Do they give hope folks with mental health issues better care, work better for houseless individuals, help the city understand the population facing substance abuse or addiction issues, and are they able to actually hold, uphold anti-racist ideals? Um, and I mean, that's a really long, big question. And, and to my knowledge, there's not an amazing way to kind of assess that. So what I did this week is in both cities, Eugene and Denver, I went through all of the reported, uh, media reported officer shootings, um, officer involved um, gun violence, um, specifically just to see kind of what the effect was on that, if there was any pattern, if um, even just like anecdotally by what the media is uh, reporting, what's going on? Um, because this is kind of one of the first places that people kind of can grasp how the criminal justice system and the police are becoming so, are, have always been oppressive um, and violent in ways that aren't what we might want as a community. Um, so in Denver, um, from June 2020 to December 2020, um, and I will say this is officer involved um, shooting. So I'm, this is, I will be talking about stories that are kind of heavy. So if you need to tune out, I don't think you'll miss too much, um, but the short of it is, uh, there are still officer involved shootings. Some of them appear justified. Um, the biggest thing that I noticed is that it's just not a, it's not as clear cut as we see um, people portray, portray it. Some people are, some suspects are very violent towards the police um, and they survive and some suspects aren't violent towards the police and they do not survive. Um, and that is concerning, obviously. Um, so in Denver, uh, seven incidents where police shot at a suspect occurred, um, five of them resulted in a civilian dying. Um, five of the incidents, involved civilians carrying guns, not all civilian, all, not all of the suspects carrying guns were the ones who ended up being killed. Um, so that those two aren't the same group. Um, one of the people killed was just carrying a knife and one of them was unresponsive in their 
car and somehow it ended up turning into a shoot shooting situation in a um which was very confusing and there wasn't actually a lot of reporting on that one um but in so basically from that limited kind of efficacy question like are fatal police interactions going down um, it's kind of unclear. I went back to 2019 and there were 10 officer involved shootings. Um, seven of those shootings then ended with the suspect getting killed um, by the officer and one suspect died by suicide. Um, so that was a year without stars. Um, to go back further, we'd have to do a lot more analysis to see if that interaction really had a change or if um, those six months were rare. Um, but it's just interesting to kind of talk about this idea of like a pilot program and things like that um, being uh, uh, one of the big ways we view policing and these types of uh, things is through these fatal police interactions. Um, and so I think it's always important to center that, that 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 type of interaction while police are still carrying guns and while uh, just because you add a community service, a community or a alternate responder model doesn't necessarily take change the police. Uh, and by, and so like that's kind of a little bit what I'm getting at here. And even in Eugene, um, which has had this program for 30, yeah, 30 years, um, they they still have these issues um, with officer involved shootings. Um, and one of the big uh, cases that of police brutality that resulted in them going 24 seven was a black family that was affected by it. And again, like a misunderstanding with a, um, uh, I couldn't find the age, but every article referred to this person as a son um, with a brain injury and like a misunderstanding as far as what he needed uh, to be calmed down, uh, a de-escalation type thing. So again, these communities responder models don't necessarily have a complete overhaul where you never have officer involved um, violent situations. Um, and then the other thing I will say, and I know you all are very sensitive to this because I've heard you say you don't want to do a pilot program um, as Star, Star was a pilot program. Um, they were only eligible, they only really had access to a few neighborhoods um, and the, they were estimating that only 2% of the calls that are currently uh, fulfilled by fleece are even eligible for to be rooted to start because of the smallness of the um, pilot. So that was kind of like another interesting point to bring up that the pilot can be good. Um, and it seems like Star did a lot of really great work with what they were were able to do. But um, I think what I've heard you all say is that that might not. We should try to keep it um, as effective as possible. And and we're seeing that these twenty four seven models are really what is needed. Um, and then, so another way. Uh, to view the efficacy is rather uh, kind of who the programs are helping. Um, Terry, so if, I, can, if I, I, I apologize for interrupting, but um, no th this is very valuable information. It's very detailed and it's, it's uh, somewhat very symptomatic of a big problem that we're looking at. And this is not to say this is, this is not helpful and informative, uh, and I think as I'm looking at this, and I, I don't have access to the full scroll going down, but there's a lot of detail mm -hmm. starting from Cahoots, going down to Denver, to Eugene, et cetera. And there's a lot of highlighting of 
of incidental and, and uh, symptomatic behavior that's coming out of this stuff. I'm wondering if there's any way to, to, to collate this at this point with full respect and regard for what you want to report to us as to say, where are we in terms of looking at what might be the, um, the touchstones for efficacy and what we might be considering in, in Amherst? And I, yeah. I know that's a tougher question, but I think a lot of these things that we're reading are, are, are certainly a number of things that we've read as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we, we join you in, in, in the, the data collection and the understanding of it. At the same time, if we're looking to, you know, move this to a place of where do we go next? Right. You know, what what have you what have you garnered from this efficacy study to this to date? You know, there's more certainly to be done. That would be informative to our process as we look at community responder models, as we look at uh, oversight. Uh, committees or, or boards, however we want to term that at some point. If you get what I'm saying, is, is that a fair request? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um, the other thing, if I may, just the other thing is like, this is a very detailed report. And it looks like you spent a lot of time on this. It was more than five minutes, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if it was more than five minutes, I'm wondering also in the future, if this is something through your, your work as a as a, a community as a, as a group of consultants, if this is something that we're going to be using as a discussion, as part of a, maybe a discussion, is there some way we can get this in advance so that we can absorb some of this information? Because I think this is extremely rich stuff that you're you're bringing, and it may be a catalyst to some thinking on our end as well. So I don't know how easily it is to. Uh, release that information to Ms. Moisten and to the, the community service uh, Can I just working say, group. I already sent it to you. Yeah. So in, in advance, it gives us a little little pre-read. So yeah. We can absorb yeah. I'm sorry it. About I, that. I apologize for you know. No, no, no. I, yeah, this I is know good you're feedback. Coming here to report and and we all appreciate it, but I'm trying to no, get no to, need to apologize to, to the, the essence of where this report is going. Yeah. So I, I think um, in the. Uh, Essence is like the, basically cahoots and and star kind of provide a really good pre pilot for us uh, to kind of learn from and and basically it seems the twenty four seven is very important. Um, it also seems that it doesn't automatically um, kind of change the the police uh, system, so it can't. When we're talking about reform and we're talking about these um, acts of violence that can happen, um, it can't be on its own. Uh, so these things are really good and they're really, really helpful. Um, and what's great about Amherst for this type of work is that um, it can actually flip over to a, um, data collection that came from Zoe Crabtree is that, um, and I'll let me resume there. I don't know why this is paused. Um, if I um, stop sharing and go to here, um, you can see that uh, from the call logs, Zoe went through and marked each call um, gave it a bin kind of from these reasons, follow up, um, suspicious, uh, community policing, noise complaint, well-being check. And you can see that by at least one person's careful analysis, possibly up to 36% of our calls could be diverted out, wouldn't be, wouldn't need an armed person. Um, so we could really do some something big in Amherst by moving some of the calls that we're seeing and some of the uh, things that we're seeing to someone who is unarmed, who can do a well-being check in a really um, kind and compassionate way. 
Um, and then there's this other idea of right now, we do have a model of um, community policing um, or where the police are initiating a lot of calls. Um, so that's another place where it's not one of our services necessarily, but that's a, uh, that's kind of a partner to the community uh, responder, the responder model, because if the police are initiating the call, then they can't diverge the call to the community responder the alternate responder uh, person because okay. they were the one who decided they viewed something as suspicious or uh, needing a uh, police interference. So that's like these communities respond, the, sorry, I keep saying community, the alternate responder models need to work with, uh, need to assess also the, um, what the boundaries are and make it really clear that like if someone's being disruptive but they're not being violent then it's the press person who goes in um so that will be something that's very necessary and that everyone needs to be aware of that the apd currently that's their i don't want to say pedagogy because that's like more like teaching but that's their philosophy is to be very proactive and that might not work that might be something we need to ask them to change um, if a community uh, a responder model would be better. Let me let me take a, a pause if I may. Uh, Terry, thank you so much. This is very detailed and very important information. There may be some comments, uh, questions coming from our group I'd like to entertain right now, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mr. Right. Vernon Jones. Well, I like very much what we're getting from Terry. There's a lot here. I'd love to have a chance to read it. Um, I'm also noting that, you know, an hour and 20 minutes of our two hour meeting is has passed. Uh, if we have other agenda items, I think we need to think about how we want to allocate the rest of our time. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. Yeah, and I, I, I agree, and I, I think that was a, a little bit earlier about moving this forward a little bit in terms of getting to the, the efficacy point, which, uh, Terry, you, you responded to. Um, one of the things that I, I think works for us, and that this is a recent conversation, clearly, but if we can have this information ahead of time before a meeting, then it, it really helps us to, to to, to digest it a little bit so we you know, the conversations are more focused. But certainly mm -hmm. this is the work you're doing. That's what we've asked you to do and, and this is happening. So we certainly appreciate it. You know, uh, and thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones, because I was trying to, I, I don't know how much more you, you have. Um, I can Terry. stop here and I'll send you the rest of the report. That would be good. And because we, we do, and this actually folds into some of the conversation we need to have about Cress. Yeah. So, um, you know, unless there are any other comments or questions from our, our group, uh, perhaps we could take, take a moment here. We welcome you um, and uh, Dr. Shabazz certainly to, to stay online with us um, if, if you're able to, uh, to hear our discussions and uh, just like to thank you for, for that information. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Wall, I just had a quick comment. Sure, Ms. Prashman. No, I, I just want to thank uh, Terry again, you know, obviously this information is very valuable and it can kind of just affirm that you're on the right track. I did see like some questions when you were saying obviously around Amherst that like the police haven't, you know, kind of drawn their gun or something like that over a decade or whatever. But I think the thing is, is that, and, and I think, you know, you're on the right track, which is, you know, what we're concerned about is the interactions with, with, with the, our population and our community. And the fact that these interactions have had a myriad of different kind of violent acts, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, just obviously, you know, God forbid fatal, you know, but obviously all of it is very traumatic, all of it is very violent. Um, and so uh, um, a lot of what you're, you're talking about in these percentages, you know, th that's the type of information that I'm really interested in, 
and mm -hmm. like to hear more. Thank you. So to Terry's credit, and, and this is um, just something having to do with our group, you know, we're, we're doing this work and, and life keeps going. We had two different illnesses in our group, um, my mother and someone else's mother that we had to attend to. And Terry did a great job of compiling all the information. Um, we will try to get it to you, um, uh, you know, before the meeting, it was sent today, but I, I'm sure no one had time to, to digest it or go over it uh, in time for, for the meeting. But we do encourage you to do so. Terry uh, hyperlinked um, much of the information so you can see some of the references um, to the Denver program, to all these different programs that Terry has included for yourself. I think that would be extremely helpful to make some of those comparisons that some of you brought up. Um, and Terry, do we, uh, did we share this, um, these charts with, uh, the CSWG? I can get permission to share them. I think uh, some yeah. might yeah. have, uh, them already and some might Okay. Have. All right. So maybe some of the ones that are pertinent to, um, the research that you've compiled. Um, would be helpful to, to make some of those comparisons. I just want to say real quick uh, regarding um, some of the work that we're doing. We're looking, of course, nationally. We're making comparisons, and then we're looking locally. And um, some of the interviews that I'm doing and um, have scheduled through email for them to answer questions or some of the services that are available here in this town already. And so, for instance, the uh, family outreach of Amherst uh, had a conversations with the folks on the crisis uh, hotline, and um, they walked me through a scenario of what happens when they get calls uh, having to do with the mental health crises or, an, or a suspected addiction crises. And that was very informative because that's, that is a group that is already situated here, you know? And um, if we think more creatively about ways in which to expand some of these services, perhaps uh, you already have folks who have expertise in the community regarding these issues and um, maybe you know, in consultation with them, we can figure out as a community how to link into those services and expand them. Because they shared that um, there are times in which, yes, they are called in to assist the police, but vice versa, there are times in which they uh, assist when it's a non-life-threatening situation. It's a, you know, and. Terry again shared with you the chart of most of those calls are non-life threatening, not you know uh, posing any threat or violence, and um, the family outreach or other mental health professionals are called in to assist at that point, and they try not to. Their 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 policy is trying not to involve the police. So that was actually reassuring to hear. What happens? Um, anecdotally, and I, I've asked them for the, uh, the figures on these calls, but is, is in line with what we heard from the chamber and the bid, is that people are uh, taught to call 911. And if you're taught to call 911, if it's a, if someone you see as a, a perceive as a vagrant and they're in front, you know, shouting obscenities in front of your storefront or whatever, and you want them to move and go away, uh, you call the police. Likewise, you know, uh, if it's a real threat, you also call the police, but one is a much lower threat and may not pose any harm at all. It's just a bother. You see it as a bother and a nuisance and you still call mm -hmm. the police. So these are things in which, you know, we could, we could been, begin to rethink. I, I, you know, I think people are indoctrinated to call 911, and maybe that is some switchboard type of uh, training that if folks call 911, 
there, there should be an assessment of, is this a mental health crisis? Is it a danger? Mm. And go through a matter of, you know, questions as to then how to direct the call to which service in the town would be most appropriate. So those are things to, to really think about. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz. And, and thank you, Terry Mullen, uh, for your, your presence and presentations here. Um, we are actually, that's actually a segue into some of the discussion we have to have because we are looking at those very questions as well as, as others. And um, we recently received some information from the, the town manager um, that in, informs that discussion as well. So we're going to move to that at this point. We, we welcome your, your presence to stay on and, and listen uh, and be informed because what we have to say through this discussion uh, to the end of our meeting and you know possibly beyond uh, are, might be informative to, to you as well as we, we feel strongly about some of these things we may be coming to recommendation on. So thank you both for being here. Welcome to stay on. And um, I, I wanna move to our, our discussion uh, about uh, our crest discussion, if we may. And I don't know um, if you're able to, um, Ms. Moyston, to put up that last document we had sent by um, Ms. Ferreira and me to the group. Yes, just one moment. Sure, thank you. Is this the correct document? I yes. I believe, that, believe that's it. And let me just make a brief statement about this opening it up. On a couple of occasions, we've tried to engage in conversation about this with the goal of coming up with uh, a, a document that we could present to the town manager as our, our statement of, of need in terms of our work as a uh, in building a better safety um, program for our town, and this was this was our our way of, of having this conversation. Since that time, we've not been able to fully engage that that process. We spent a lot of time on questions one through three. We didn't get very far. Since that time, we've heard presentations, certainly from Mr. Bachelman at, uh, uh, at town meeting. We've received other information from Mr. Bachelman regarding some specific numbers. And I think what I'd like to encourage our group to do is to have this discussion, but with, the, with an eye toward not getting, um, you know, bogged down in the, the details of any of the information regarding numbers and money, but to really focus on the nature and substance of what we're talking about, we might need as a community, uh, you know, in Amherst, um, in, in terms of CRESS, because it's not just CRESS, but it's also some other programs that support it on on a on a on a townwide basis. So. Uh, Ms. Ferreira and I were proposing uh, the, this format for discussion. We spent a lot of time on questions one through three. And just to refresh your memory, if you haven't, if you don't remember it, try to just uh, pull all the numbers together in a weighted fashion to see where we had lots of agreement. It certainly wouldn't uh, mean we can't discuss any further, but the, the ultimate goal is we've got to get to a point where we can present something to our, um, our town manager as he has a budget deadline coming very rapidly. And we, we have to get this information to him so he can effectively uh, present something and certainly understand you know, where we're coming from. So let me just, just stop there and uh, see, uh, Ms. Ferreira, any, any comments you want to have? Because you were part of helping put this together, certainly. No, just in terms of us, yeah, like kind of focusing and um, 
beginning the discussion. I mean, obviously, you know, like uh, Mr. Russ Vernon Jones has said it last time, one, two, three, we had a lot of discussion beforehand, not to say that we agree with one, two, three, obviously not. It's just that we've had discussions on it. It's just that, um, you know, and Mr. Bachman has come up with, with a budget in regards to how to uh, address some of the issues that we had with one, two, three. Um, so I think we could kind of, We'll start with that and then kind of move from there and, and focus on what we need to focus on. And there's some other ones that um, we saw some agreement on. Um, we could still talk, <coughs> but we could probably move quickly through some of those. So thank you. And uh, be, before we, we start, Mr. Bachman, I appreciate your presence here. I don't know if there's any anything you want to contribute to this at um, before we have this discussion or that might be informative or you want to just follow along with us? No, I think this has been, I mean, I think uh, that consultants have set the stage for this conversation. So I appreciate the work that they've laid out and the work that you've done to prepare for the conversation. So I'll just listen at this point. Thank you. Ms. Um, Ms. Morrison, can you make that a little bit larger? Thank you. So this, this first question we talked about at length at, our, at, a, at a couple of meetings ago, and this is about as far as we got with no resolution to it. I wanna say as we're going forward, certainly you know, our ultimate goal is to be able to come up with something that we can be put in writing and send a message forward. So let me stop there. Mr. Vernon Jones. Well, I think questions one through three have been replaced by the motion that we passed at the last meeting asking the town manager to investigate a 24 seven program and uh, how to fund it. I think we are no, my sense is we are no longer interested in what it says in one through three. We've said we want a 24 seven program. And I would propose we go on to question four or some other question that you think is useful. That's, that's my understanding as, as well. And I wanted to just make sure I just canvas the, the entire group to see if there are any other comments about that. I don't think there's any reason to, to go back to that. Uh, and I think it would save us a lot of time. Ms. Walker. Um, I just wanted to agree with Mr. Vernon Jones um, and then also thank Mr. Bockelman for the document that he sent us detailing exactly what or an estimate of what the cost might be for such a program. So I think that's also helpful to refer to later when we go back to revisit questions one through three. Thank yeah. And, uh, Ms. Ms. Ferreira, yes. Yeah. And just to kind of, you know, I think the only thing that we could do to, just to kind of make sure we're all on the same page, right, is that one, um, that that um, you know whatever salary is on hold you know whatever police positions we're not going to be you know agreeing to any of those in terms of you know funding those um, and then you know whatever the budget is in terms of transferring those additional positions you know whatever the wh wherever the money is going to be in terms of whether it's the police or whatever else it's going to be funneled to um, Crest and the budget that they need, you know, to, to be 24 seven. And then definitely no increases in terms of the APD budget. Thank you, Ms. Ferreira. And then what I'd like to is just to see if Mr. Bachman had anything else to add in terms of what he, the budget that he sent, um, you know, if he had any anything to clarify on there or if that kind of speaks for itself. All right, let me, let me go to Mr. Bachman in a minute. Uh, Ms. Walker had her hand up. No, I think that the budget, I mean, there, there's the assumptions Walker, that we put. I'm sorry. Was, oh, that, sorry, was that a previous hand that didn't get erased, Ms. Walker? No, sorry. You're good? Yes, thank you. Okay, Mr. Bachman, I'm sorry. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, no, the budget uh, has some assumptions in there. I tried to be explicit about the assumptions that, that, you know, like there's no, we don't expect it to pay rent or all those things, but we tried to incorporate as much as we could uh, in the um, in the in the budget. I do note that the positions are all level, uh, as budgeted or at the first step. So I don't really know what what a social worker gets paid. We haven't done that kind of research to see if that's a competitive wage or not to attract people to take these positions. So we have a social worker on our wage scale, and so this is put placed at that wage scale on the first step. 
have have the the members of our group been able to um, see the um, communication from Mr. Bachman relative to what he, what he's referring to at this particular time? Ms. Yes. Morrison? Yeah. Oh, you have yeah, just people raising. Okay. No, if wait. you haven't, you know that that's fine. I, I think it's an important document to look at as we go forward because it's certainly going to inform what we have our in terms of our next steps. Uh, Ms. Morrison, could you scroll down to see the full piece of question four? Whoop, yeah. Um, this one had a, a little more variability to it. And um, I'd like to hear the, the comments from the, from, the, from the group at this point. Any comments you want to make on this? Ms. Pat, and then Ms. Owen, and then Ms. Ferreira. I can't speak. I can't speak for everyone, but I'm not going to support any of this. Number four. But I respect whatever the group decides. If I if I may ask, uh, where are your reservations? If that's if that's something you feel like sharing. Say that again. Are you, you would you feel like sharing your reservations on it? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I do not think uh, providing additional training to the police will make any reform or make any changes. So I don't want to dwell into that. There is already budget for police uh, ongoing in-service training or whatever. So I don't want to waste my time discussing um, question number four. Understood. With respect to do other people, I mean, you know, we're a team. So whatever the team decides, you know, I, I will live with it. Understood, thank you. I just wanted to be sure that you had an opportunity to expand upon that. Not that the, you need an invitation to expand, Miss Pat. I know you will if you want to. <laughs> so we, but that that's that's my job here. So uh, let's see, Miss Owen, you had your hand up. Yeah, I'm kind of on the mid, um, on the fence with the police training or the in services and training for them, just because I'm not sure they could be effective. So I wouldn't want to waste resources there. I am on board to hear what people think and to hear people who do think we should invest money here because I think that if as a group we do decide to provide eight additional hours of training for every APD member that it has to be really intentional and not broad. Thank you. Ms. Ferreira. Yeah, for me, um, yeah, I, I don't agree with um, any allocation of funds um, for them and, and for a or A or B. Um, I really think that there needs to be an assessment done um, in terms of whatever is left over for them to do, which might only be, for me, it would only be for them to, to if there's an actual violent type of incident that needs to, to be dealt with, then they would be the ones with a very small staff to be dealing with. So therefore, because I don't think training is, is effective for them in terms of like a, a bigger department, it would be you know, limited training to a, a smaller staff because I don't think they should be dealing with noise complaints, disturbances, even traffic stops. I don't think they should be dealing with traffic stops. So it, it needs to be another group. We need, you know, anyway, that, those are my, that's, that's my thought. So, right. um, so yeah, so once they have a smaller group and there's an assessment, then we can see what they might need in terms of training and software and all of that. Thank you. Um... I think Ms. Pat, you had your hand up again, then Mr. Vernon Jones. Well, there are a couple electronic hands up too. Uh, Ms. Ms. Yeah, Bowman I'm trying to get them all. It's Ms. kind of hard Walker. to come up with different times on my screen. Sorry. Okay, no, Ms. So Bowman, Ms. Walker has had, I'll, had, I'll go had to the names up. Yeah, let me go. Let me go to the the, the hands up. Sorry, Ms. Pat, if that's okay with you. Sure. Um, I don't know. Um, so, Ms. Bowman, yeah. Ms. Bowman and Ms. Walker, they came Hi. up. Hi. Um. So I. <clears throat> Excuse me. I absolutely do not agree on training officers. Um, they have been shown time and time again to be set in their ways. And I don't think there's enough training to untrain what they've learned as far as their the systematic racist um, organization that they work for. Also, um, I wanted to say to Mr. Bachelman, um, I just did a quick search on online and it looks like um, social workers in 
for example, the Springfield area, um, the average the average base salary is uh, fifty eight uh, k a year, and that is someone who has worked one to three years. I don't believe we should be taking anybody who's worked under one year. They need to come in with experience. Um, but, uh, you know, we should absolutely be looking at someone who's experienced and we need to be not looking towards officers as that in that role. Um, I think that we're setting ourselves up for a lot of failure to even um, entertain that as an option. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Bowman, uh, on that piece on the social workers. I'm just taking some notes here myself. Uh, Ms. Walker, and then I'll go to Ms. Pat. Thank you. Um, so I just also agree with what Ms. Bowman just stated that when we're looking to hire employees for the program that we should absolutely look for people that have training. Um, and I, I don't think that we would necessarily want to, um, to hire entry level uh, people for, this, for these positions. Um, but then I just wanted to go back to what Ms. Pat was saying and also agree that I think we can completely uh, jump over this section right now. I don't think we should invest any funds in police training. It has been shown time and time again that it does not have any effect. Um, we saw in the most recent incident of police killing that a highly trained officer that was actually in charge of training other officers was the one who made the mistake, well, quote right. unquote. Um, and so I just want to point that out that that we don't really need to discuss this anymore. And I think we can move on to the next section. Thank you. I, I did have a comment. Um, uh, let me go to you, Mr. Vernon Jones first, then Ms. Pat, then I'll go. Um, well, I think that, I mean, you heard Terry Mullen say that having a crest program uh, doesn't change the police and you still have a police department. Um, my recommendation would be that, I mean, I think we're going to have a police oversight board that's going to implement new policies and try to shift the mission of the police department. And I would not put more money in the police budget for training. I would put some money in the oversight board's budget that they could use to train um, police officers or in how to um, implement new policies that that board came up with. Um, but you know, I will respect the will of the majority that we don't need to fight over that. Uh, but I would like to ask the town manager if you would find out whether or not something is needed uh, to get timely, uh, transparent data posted uh, by the police department. Um, there was some discussion about they didn't have the computer program or whatever needed to do it. I don't know if that's true or not, but I think we want the police to be posting uh, data by race about stops and arrests uh, on a regular basis so that the entire community can oversee the police department as well as the oversight board. Okay, I'll, I'll swing back to you, Mr. Bachman, if you want to comment on that, but I want to go to Ms. Pat next, please. Ms. Pat. Okay, so I just want to remind us all that the APD was tasked several years ago to do data collection on traffic stops. And it was done by the town meeting body at that time and the select board actually supported that. And it was, um, it was uh, an African-American woman, Ms. Jackie Hazard, who, who made sure that the town, town meeting you know, passed, the, uh, passed it. So it's, it's all about the will I don't think APD wants to be transparent in terms of data collection. So using the excuse of um, software, it's just to avoid the issue. If they want to do it, they will do it. So I don't think we should waste our time discussing whether or not we should uh, you know, have APD have software. It's just a waste of time. They don't want to do it. 
Thank you, Ms. Pat. I, I think the comment I want to make is related to what you just said, Ms. Pat. And I think that I, there have been a number of groups who have asked for information, uh, especially with regard to race, ethnicity, and, and class. Uh, in, and this is not easily gotten from anybody, apparently, and it keeps occurring as an, as an issue. So my only thing, while I, 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 you know, come, come in line with what you're saying, you know, certainly if an organization wants to do that, they would. My question about this is that do, does the town, not necessarily the police department, does the town in capacity with the, it, in collaboration with the police or any other organization have the ability to set up systems where we can collect data that are responding to the questions coming from our community. If, you know, if us and other organizations are coming to the, to the police department saying, we want to get this, this particular information about race and it's not there, then um, could we create the, the structure and capacity to do it and compel the police in or the town to do it once the tool is there? So I, I, I'm just raising that. I, I, I would not want us to miss an opportunity to create a, a, a technological structure which allows us to, to, to collect as much information as we need in whatever form we need it and also be able to analyze it in a way that is useful to our, our, our community, especially if we're gonna have an oversight um, uh, board or, or something of that nature in the future. So. I, 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 you know, I agree with you, Ms. Pat. I, I think it's a motivational thing. You know, if you want to do it, you would have done it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I got that. At the same time, is this an opportunity to create the structure by which to, 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 you know, you know, drive that motivation into that structure and make it make it happen? So I want to just raise that and then go back to Mr. Bachman. I think it was a question before me, before me and Ms. Ms. Pat, to um, to you, and then I'll go to Ms. Bowman. So if I re so I think if the question is can we collect that information we will I will find out for you and and it you know it seems pretty straightforward and if there's a technological challenge we can th th those are things that can be overcome with, usually without much effort but we'll I'll, I will look into that and I think Mr. Vernon Jones you had a question for Mr. Malcolm before that did I miss that I no it was only to find out whether there is a need you know some sort of technological need in order to do this. Uh, That's it. Yeah. Sort of, I think I think we're going to recommend this, and I just want to make sure that if there is some budget need, we know what it what it is, and it's taken care of. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. And then, Ms. Bowman, and then so uh, I think Herrera. that the what um, sorry. So I'm going to reiterate that. I absolutely don't think that anything should come out of the budget to, first of all, train police. And that should not be our responsibility. Our responsibility is to pass down recommendations, but I am absolutely hard set on the fact that we should absolutely not give any sort of leeway to the Amherst Police Department. And I'm really, this whole structure of the police are, is, in, is literally institutional racism. It's, it's systemic racism. I mean, just, oh my gosh. Like we're giving too many passes to an organization that was literally built on the back of collecting slaves to return to slave owners. And I don't care what it looks like right now. Look at other countries. There are many other countries that don't even use guns. They have tasers. That's what they use in order to subdue somebody, not kill somebody. Police in America are trained to kill if they think that one, they might get killed, and two, that if they think that they, there might be litigation against them because they didn't kill their suspect, that is another reason. Mm. They are shooting to kill. Our black sons and our black women and other people of color are dying. 
And do we need to really wait until this happens directly in our town before we make changes? Like, come on, people. Like, we really need to look at this as if we were in Minnesota. That's how we need to be looking at this. We need to go to the extra extreme to prevent things from happening. I don't want to wait until my son dies in order to find to for, for this town to be like, oh my God, one of our, one of our, our, our community members died and we had this opportunity to make actual change. I don't care about people's feelings. People don't care about black people's feelings. And I'm so upset and I'm so tired of black people caring about white people's feelings when white people don't care about us. And yes, I'm making a general statement. And if it doesn't apply to you as a white person, then you shouldn't feel anyway. But if you feel some way about this, then maybe you need to look at how you're looking at the world. I don't, I'm not gonna be apologetic about this. I am concerned about the safety of my son. I'm concerned about the safety of their friends. I'm concerned about the safety of people in this community who have mental health issues that already have issues with the police that have to have and be face to face with police officers. No, they cannot be trained. Absolutely not. They are already, they are already set in a certain mindset. They cannot be trained. If, if, if that is the, if that's where we're going with this and we're like, oh, we're gonna dump a bunch of money into training police officers, then again, I'm questioning, why am I here? Because that's not reform. That is not defunding police. That is supporting a, a, a structural institution that has been made to break low income BIPOC people. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not for that. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Bowman, and and, and I, I think that your comments resonates with a lot of folks. And I, you know, part of our our thing here is to take take in those comments. It's very clear we have some very clear and strong comments about training and other things, and the history of this is very apparent to a lot of a lot of folks. Um, I don't want us to lose sight of of what we have to do in terms of presenting this message which incorporates the, 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 your sentiments and, and other people's sentiments. And um, it's incumbent upon us to, to send this message and to, and to get through this. This training piece is very clearly um, in, uh, a, a matter for us. And I don't think anyone's endorsing training right now. We're certainly probably in the opposite direction. But I, I do want us to state our comments. I do want us to state ourselves clearly. And I do want us to get through this so that we can begin to articulate to this entire community what it is we, we, we want. Ms. Ferreira, I'll take a, a comment from you right now, and then I'm going to move on to question five. Well, I mean, I think that's, that's what I want to do is kind of move us to, to the next question, which is to say, right, that we already had seven, if we totaled it, like leaning to disagree and no leaning, seven, leaning to agree, five, right? So we already know, and, and basically by us having this discussion, it just really uh, cemented that that we have a seven to five basically saying no to those to those two um, questions and then for us to move on, right? To, 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 to number five. Can you scroll um, down a little bit, Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, Moisten, to question so we can see the rest of the questions? No, 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 uh, I'm just saying, no, no, I'm just saying that on question four, originally we had leaning to disagree, four of us yeah, said, yeah. leaning to disagree. And then three of us that said no leaning. And then all we wanted to do was obviously have discussion around it, but I think we're still there, right? We had seven no's <laughs> and exactly. five yeses. So basically saying, basically saying that we're at a no with A and B. You see what I'm saying? We're at I do no. see exactly what you're saying. And, exactly. and I appreciate it. I should have responded more, more coherently <laughs> to, to that than I did. But I, I get what you're saying. And I, I, and I think it's clear what the, you know, the message from our group right now is yes. related to that and thank you thank yeah, you yeah so that, that we can so we can move on from, from that and question then five. yeah and then so that we can continue to move but one thing that i want us to stick a pin on is we still have to have hopefully at the end right because i want us to get through this form but at the end is what we're really thinking around we haven't talked about the police because i think i've hinted at my thoughts around it you know what do we think about for them right but for whatever is left that we might think 
you know, we might want them to do or not. But I think we need to have that conversation. I, I and I, I agree with you. And, and I think today is to see how far we can get through this with the eye toward having a couple of people begin to to craft us into a message that is not like this with a series of questions, but a series of statements relative to what, what it is the, the CSWG wants to see happen in, in, in this community. And uh, getting through this with our commentary is important for us. Otherwise, we can't get to the next step. And I, I, I can't say this strongly enough that we only have a couple of weeks. To, and, and I think we have enough information and certainly enough sentiment behind this to come up with something. But we, we have to get this in, in place to the town manager um, and so that he can actually have an opportunity to consider and support what we're doing. Right now, we, we're not there. And I, that's why I'm, I'm pressing this now to, to, to get us to a point where we can do it. The sentiment, I feel it myself. So I, I you know, it's, 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 it's not about that. We've, we've, we've only got a couple of weeks until, and I, I wanna ask the, Mr. Bachman at some point when he actually needs this from us so that we can, we can start working this process. Uh, we can talk about it for as long as we want, but if we don't put something forward, then, then, then we, we haven't done our charge. So I'd like to go to question five, please, if we may. This one was very heavily weighted uh, um, in one direction. Uh, again, commentary would be important from our, our, our group. Um, it seems like we have a, a like I said, it's, very, it's leaning it very strongly in one way, but we do have to create a, a document. Mr. Uh, Vernon Jones and then Ms. Ms. Pat. Well, clearly in number C, we're talking about a lot more than four. Um, so, yeah. I, you know, we're talking enough, enough for 24 um, seven. Other than that, I, I, I think we're close to consensus and if we're not, we should hear about it now. Ms. Pat. So, in this, for the sake of time, it looks like majority of us want uh, question number five. If we start going into deep discussion, it might take longer tonight. Yeah. So I don't know how people are feeling, but I'm okay with uh, the result that we have, learning to agree 42. Uh, I don't know who had their hand up first, Ms. Owen or Ms. Ferreira. Uh, Ms. Ferreira had her hand up first. Ms. Ferreira, then Ms. Owen, thank you. Yeah, mine is really quick. I agree too. We don't need to spend time discussing this. The only thing that I wanted to say is in terms of making sure that there's a there's a separate uh, number too for, for Crest, right? So there'll be the 911 that will dispatch it and do an assessment, but they should also have their own separate number. <clears throat> as they'll have their own separate space and have their own kind of, you yep. know, be a separate program. That's it. Thank you. Ms. Owen. That was actually my comment too. Was it the numbers being separate? Were you trying to copy Ms. Ferreira? <laughs> something like that. <laughs> no, something like that, yeah. Understood. Yeah, and, I, and I, 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 I'm pushing this a bit because I think, you know, as Ms. Ferreira and I were talking about this, there's, we had a lot of the sentiment. This is, the, this is also the time for folks to, who didn't get a chance to respond in writing to the actual grid that was put forth uh, behind the work of, of Mr. Vernon Jones. They said, that, you know, this would be a better format to do this. So we want to hear what you have to, to say. And our, our goal would be to incorporate this information in, in a document that we're going to put together. This, this is our group talking to the town. So I, I want us to, to be you know, very purposeful and forceful about it, make sure we get all, all the comments in there. So that's question five. Thank you. It was heavily weighted and appreciate the additional comments. Let's go on to six. Again, this is one of those, and uh, there's, there's people who had who may have had no leaning or didn't get an opportunity to, to speak to this. This would be the opportunity to do so. Uh, Ms. Ferreira, then Ms. Pat. 
So, um, yeah, I definitely agreed with everything uh, besides uh, E in terms of the, the diversity, equity, inclusion for the town. Um, you know, I don't know if some of you all know or not, I was a, a, a chief diversity officer at UMass for, for quite a many years, so I definitely know what that job entails. Um, so for me, why I said no leaning is because it, I, I wouldn't want a position to be created in town just in name only, because I've been in that, in, in that position, right? It would have to be a position that actually has power, has resources, has staff, and is able to do something, <laughs> you know, because if not, you're just setting up that, that, that person for failure, okay? And just to say that someone's there, but they're not doing much. So that's the only reason my no leaning, I would have to hear what the town I'm in support of it, obviously. I'm in, in support of having a, a diversity officer, but that person or that position would have to have the power, the resources, and staff. That's what I'm at. Ms. Pat. So, what I want to say very quickly is that I want to applaud uh, the town manager for taking the initiative to create um, is it a committee to look into on um, you know issues of uh, homelessness. So my question is, do we still have to recommend this? Because you know the town manager is already working on this. I'll, I'll circle back to, to Mr. Bachelman in a second. I, I also had a comment on this, is that I I think that this you know is is a systemic question for me. I I think at one point I was at no leaning on this because we talk about a youth center and we talk about a, a, a town office with diversity, equity, inclusion, and we talk about a cultural multicultural center. These, these are more global kinds of things which absolutely support our, our youth and young people and BIPOC people in this community and, um, and housing, which is a whole big issue that's still getting uh, batted around in, in our town. So th this is a question um, that has a lot to do with safety and security of our community. So I'm, I'm not sure to what extent uh, I wanna put energy into this one as opposed to other issues around safety. And maybe if you wouldn't mind, Mr. Bachman, I'll, I'll go to you to see if you have a comment or response. Wait, to actually, Ms. Ms. Walker had her hand up too. Oh, I lost my screen again. I'm sorry, I got a couple of screens. Ms. Walker, I'm so sorry. Thank you. It's okay, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to agree. I think this section is actually also like extremely important and I think it may require more in-depth conversation. I apologize for the background noise. Um, and, and I think that these things are absolutely, like the BIPOC community depends on these things also for safety. Um, and then just as a response to Ms. Pat's question, like I, I also am, am very happy that the town manager implemented a group, but I do think it's still important for us to address it just because it isn't always that the BIPOC homeless community is going to be centered or focused in that work. And I still think it's our responsibility to consider them in this because it does like it does encompass their safety as well. That may not necessarily be addressed or a focus of the other group. So I think we should, I don't think we need to spend extensive time on it, but I do think it should be something that we consider. Mr. Bachelman, I said I'd come back to you. Your, your name yeah. was raised a couple of times in those questions. No, I agree with Ms. Walker. And I think that if you didn't include it, I think people would say, well, did you forget us? And I think you can't, this is crucial to your mission as well. Thank you. So, um, I'm conscious of the time. I'm actually looking at it at 7.38. I'm, I'm willing to keep moving with this a little bit to see how far we get. Are there any objections to that with the group? We're all good for a minute? Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, Ms. Morris, if we can move down to what other proposals- would... I'm raising my hand. Ms. Pat, oh Ms. God, Pat I didn't see. Oh God, I was moving too fast there, Ms. Ms. Pat. Just this, very quickly, I just want to let, you know, the rental assistant, the town is already doing that. My problem with that particular one is that um, it was, it's been contracted out to an agency that is led by white that I had sent some people and I don't want to be too specific 
to apply for rental assistance because of um, cultural ignorance, some BIPOC families, low income that need the funding didn't get it. So that's where I will stop because I do help people as you know, part of volunteer work and um, it hasn't been very successful. So I would like the rental assistance program return back to the town you know, find a local organization or whatever, locally, instead of somewhere in Greenfield. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Sorry, I missed you, Ms. Pat. I just, yeah. a lot of screens going on here. Um, but thank you for that. Yeah. Um, no other comments, we can kind of move to um, what are the proposals would you like to add and uh, we can scroll that down a little bit. Thank you, Ms. Moyston. Uh, question one, there was broad agreement on that. There was no leaning. Is there any discussion? Do people wanna comment on that now before we you know, move forward in our discussion? This is about multiracial teams and appropriate expertise, clinical mental health, social work who are unarmed and respond as needed. I think this is a, goes back to an earlier issue, certainly about training of people who would be interacting with our community outside of the police department. Any comments from folks? Uh, hold on a second. Ms. Walker. Um, I think I may have been the person that was no leaning and I think my no leaning was due to the two person um, just because I was unsure if that was all, if that would be sufficient because I wanted more research before I decided if it was a two person job, but I do agree with the rest of the sentence, just not the number of people that was assigned to it. I'm just unsure about that. Certainly, thank you. Yeah, uh, Ms. Ferreira. Sorry, I was muted. Yeah, I think the, the same thing with me in terms of, you know, I'm in agreement with what Mr. Walker said. But I think that in terms of what other proposals would you like to add, I think that that's a separate thing, Mr. Wiley, in terms of, so is that, are we gonna come back to that at the end? What other proposals we'd like to add? Yeah, I just think these, these yeah. Okay, so we'll do that at the end. We'll just keep going. I'm going to these questions actually, that I, and I read that statement. So yeah, so question one, Question two, Actually, yeah. we already Ms. Did Mr. Vernon-Jones, and then Ms. Pat. I'm sorry. I thought we already did this. No? We, we haven't do done that. We haven't gone we've through everything this. on it. But it, a lot of them, we do have agreement. So I think we could probably go through it pretty quickly. But there's a couple that are not, that we do need to discuss. With oh. regard to question one, um, many of the programs that we've uh, read about have a medic as part of the team. Uh, and I would like to ask the town manager to have a conversation with the fire department uh, about whether uh, it appears to them that that would be useful uh, in terms of what the needs are in the community uh, or whether the medical stuff is all taken care of by our ambulance crews and we should be focusing on just mental health clinicians and social workers. Uh, Mr. Bachman could explore that uh, and come back to us with some information. I think that would be helpful. Would you be able to do that for us, Mr. Bachman? Thank you, and I, and, I, and I apologize, I think, for the confusion I contributed to that by asking that earlier question about other proposals. That was a separate thing, Ms. Ferreira. Thank you for pointing that out. These are these are questions. These are about community responders for equity, safety, and service, crest related. So that's where the first question came from. The second question um, we're on right now, and Mr. Mr. Vernon Jones has asked, has requested, made a request, which Mr. Bachman will be following up on. Other comments on question two. Uh, Ms. Walker has Ms. her Walker. hand up. Yep. Um, I do think it will be helpful to get that information from Mr. Bachelman, but I also do just want to say that I, I personally think that I can't think of a specific incidence, but it may like there are some mental health crises or other crises that may require medics. 
And so I don't think that those things necessarily should be separated. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Ms. Ferreira. Yeah, I think when uh, when we I was we were doing the research and I was doing the research, that's what it you know the teams always had like a medic and then you know social work, mental health. I think that that's stuff that we can still kind of work through, um, you know. So, but I'm still in agreement. With question one in terms of it being multiracial teams and so on and so forth, unarmed. Yeah, it's multiracial, and also I wanted to offer too. You know. Um, you know, in some ways, you know, uh, multilingual where it's appropriate. I mean, I think we have to look at, you know, we have uh, a, a multilingual community and, um, you know, certainly Spanish and English take have taken precedence, but we have other languages that we have to be aware of and, and can we effectively respond. So, but that's a detail going down the line, but certainly something we can put forward as we begin to, to write this up. So um, may we move on to question three? You all can read that. Mm -hmm. There was uh, all kinds of agreement here. Again, I want to remind folks that this was just, this is just information that came from people who responded in writing. There may have been some of you who did not have an opportunity to do that or would prefer to, to present, um, you know, verbally uh, in this format. So this would be the opportune time to, to do that if you have comments and I'll recognize folks. Nothing. Question four. Teams can call for assistance from the APD and uh, Amherst Fire Department, ambulance, and everything whenever it is needed. This seems to be related to, to other pieces of what we're talking about. Any comments on that? Again, this was a higher agreement area and it doesn't include folks who did not have a chance to, to respond in writing. Mr. Bogman, I would just suggest for until uh, question six, just to have people just read it and, and then whoever has any comments, just make comments so we can, and, and, you know, because of the time. Yeah, we're just looking, that's just looking down the line. Okay. Question five. Comments. This is another one. Um, question six. Question seven. Ms. Ferreira. Yeah, so I was one of the no leanings um, with this one. And I think we've talked about it, right? Because I really think it needs to be 24-7 uh, because um, I would not want the police dealing with any of these types of issues. Um, and that's why we need 24-7 program. Thank you, Ms. Walker. Um, just because I was also one of the no leanings on this question, I wanted to amplify what Ms. Ferreira said because that was also my exact reasoning. Thank you. Any other comments before we move on? Question eight. You can scroll down a little bit, Ms. Thank you, Ms. Moyston. There's only one leaning to disagree in the uh, B section of this question. And I don't know if anyone wants to comment on that or people who didn't want, didn't write, put anything in writing, Ms. Ms., uh, Ms. Pat. So I believe I'm the one who did leaning to disagree um, is we, you know, we need a more robust uh, discussion about 
uh, connecting people to social services because sometimes it might be harmful, even though we're trying to do good. So mm. I, I have been a foster parent and I know as much as the system wants to help kids, sometimes it's not perfect or solution and you can't use poverty, you know, social class to um, reflect, you know, but anyway, I think we need a, a more robust discussion on this. We don't have enough time tonight. So I have a mixed feeling about how we refer people because that's the traditional system we currently have. I mean, that's what the school system does, for example. So we just mm -hmm. have to be cautious about that. Thank you, Ms. Walker and then Ms. Owen. Um, so I actually just wanted to, so I think I was agreeing on this one, but now that I have heard Ms. Pat speak, I actually fully agree with what she's saying. And I don't think that in most cases, it might not even be helpful to connect them to social services. So I think it should be like, I mean, I also agree it, it deserves more conversation, but I think it should be like on a case by case basis and there should be more evaluation and thought go, going into that than just we connect clients to social services. Yeah, there are side issues for a lot of, a lot of folks being connected immediately to institutional pieces of our support system. So I, 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 I would tend to agree with that as, as well. Ms. Owen, you had your hand up? Yeah, um, I just wanna agree with what everyone's saying. And I think that with dealing with social services, everybody's case is a little bit different. As a foster alumni myself, I can speak for myself and say like the Department of Children and Families really doesn't prioritize well-being. So I think it's really important for this program to be connected with community um, resources and nonprofits that may be able to fill the gaps in the services that that family or young person or whoever is being referred might need. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. Well, I like this emphasis on things being on a case by case basis, but why don't we simply delete uh, B uh, and understand that, you know, it's something that the program will have to work out on a case by case basis to best meet the needs of their clients. Okay, we'll let that question sit in the air for a moment, Mr. Mr. Vernon Jones, if you don't mind, and uh, Ms. Ferrer. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, you know, I've, I've heard everyone's kind of viewpoint and I agree with whether, you know, for certain circumstances, that's going to be the case, but I do agree more so with a case by case, because I think these are going to be, hopefully, right, we're going to hire some veteran folks that are going to be able to be making assessments, engaging, right, engaging with the, with the person, asking them, because I also see where it, it can be harmful if you are helping a person and they do need help, right, because I, I have an elderly mom, right, and when she has different health issues, I need to connect her to services. You know what I'm saying? But I'm doing it in a in an empathetic, in a helpful, in a healing way, right? And I'm connecting her and she's getting the benefits of it, right? So that's what I would hope would happen, right? These are the type of people going to be hiring people that are empathetic, you know, that are, are, are compassionate and, and understand and not are not going to be racist and just putting people into institutions to harm them, you know? So I think that's the thing is to not just say, okay, this is not good. It's an assessment and hiring people that actually know, know what they're doing and doing it in the right way to provide the people the services they need. Thank you, thank you all very, very much. I, you know, we're, we're at the end of this. There's still more work to do with this. Certainly there's still more thought and discussion that needs to get to this. I, Mr. Vernon Jones, I, I will, I'll take your, your comment or question and Ms. Ferreira's, and then I wanted to, to speak to Ms. directly to Mr. Bachelman. Well, um, I really appreciate that Mr. Bachelman working on the financial end of things. There are a lot of details to be figured out about implementing this program. Uh, and I would like us to request that the town manager uh, begin if, uh, or continue if he's already begun, um, to, to work out the operational details of what what will it take to actually implement uh, what we've uh, what we've put out here. Okay, the, let me float that to you, Mr. Bachelman, and uh, I'm going to I'll join with a comment in a moment. Someone else had I forget I'm losing, Ms. Ferreira. Yeah. 
So uh, what about the um, other proposals and things like that? I mean, are we going to table that to another discussion or? Because obviously I think there's, you know, like for me, I still have, you know, questions and, and things like that and other kind of ideas and proposals and stuff like that. That may be related to, to what I was going to say, and you'll tell me if it isn't <laughs> for sure. But uh, let, let me just say one of the one of the closing remarks on this piece of our work I wanted to say is that there's two things I wanted to ask Mr. Bachelman, um for when the uh, you know we're going to be putting together a a substantive and and well-articulated proposal to you using our own resources and maybe the input from our uh, certainly our consulting group when would you need something from us now that you've extended the deadline for you to absorb it and actually be able to understand it and articulate our and, and hopefully support you know our, our proposal to the town council so that date would be important for us to know and the other thing I think may be related, uh, Ms. Ferreira, is I'd like to um, uh, ask uh, in this group for a couple of people to work on uh, a document uh, that would be a proposal that 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 collates and and pulls together the information we've just talked about with with Cress, so that we can begin to. Uh, be more concrete with what we're uh, re requesting, what we're proposing to the town manager so that we give him information in a timely manner. So those are my two things. I, I don't know if that's related, Ms. Ferreira, because that may be a place where we can put your, your question, you know, where do we get more discussion? I, I think we, if we articulate, I'm thinking if we can articulate the document, we ourselves can have that discussion before we further discussion before we submit it to the town manager. That's my thought. Um, anyway, Mr. 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 Bachman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wiley. So I think the um, best case scenario at this point is if the working group actually voted a motion at your next meeting. Uh, that means someone could work on a motion. I mean, you will have then have already, well, depending. So so I think if you could vote a motion at your next meeting um, with what you're, and you, you have the framework, I think that you've just gone through the things. Right. So you could make that motion as long as you want, um, but, or make it succinct and say, here's, here's the Im immediate budget implications. Cause that's what I need today as soon as possible. You have until, uh, I think we said May 15th for the final report. Um, and so then you have time to, some time to pull that together with your consultants. Um, the other question I have for you in the, in the working group is when you would like to appear before the council. Um, we tentatively scheduled that for May 17th, but they also meet May 14th and they also meet during June. So if you can talk about that for next week, um, what, when you would like to, uh, you know, I, I assume that the working group will want to make a presentation, a public presentation to the council uh, based on its work and whatever fits into your schedule, they meet Monday nights at 630. So Mr. Bachman, you have to, on May 1st, you have to present uh, be able to present something to the, the, the town, correct? Correct, correct. <laughs> so just working backwards, anything we wanted to submit to you in writing, uh, motion related or otherwise, has to be received by you when? Uh, I'm asking that by May 21. May 21? Yep. Okay. My assumption it was a lot earlier. Well, if you, I mean, you don't have another meeting between now and then. I mean, if you can vote tonight, that'd be oh, ideal. Oh, you said May 21. I, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. April 21. My bad. Oh, my God. Bad. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so May, I feel May 21. Yeah. I said, I'd love oh, to have until May 21. <laughs> so May 21. No. April. April 21. April 21. My mistake. No, okay. May 21 was wrong. May, April 21 is when you need to hear something from us. Okay. Um, I guess in line with that, I want to go back to 
having a couple of us work on something that could be well let me let me stop there let me let me go back uh, miss walker let me take your comment and then i'll go back so i i think i was going to suggest something similar to what you were going to say i was going to say in light of um this information, I would suggest if it's possible to have a subcommittee work on work on like uh, an outline for a document or a draft of a document that we can present to the town manager with the with like a basic outline of what we have right now that can be presented to the whole group at our next meeting. I don't know if there it would be possible to have a subcommittee meet on Monday um, and draft a document that we can finalize on the twenty first. Well, I, I you know. Certainly, the, the the sooner the the better, and it, you know, here it is. It's Wednesday evening, and we 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 do need to pull our resources together to get something in writing. And if we're going to put anything in motion in motion form, we have to have it before the town, you know, ready for the town manager earlier than later. Um, I'd be happy to work on on something with someone. Um, I've got a full load going on already, but I, I think I, I would, we need a couple of people working on something to get us uh, at foundation before we move forward. Mr. Vernon Jones? I, I'd be happy to be part of working on it. Ms. Owen? I'd also be happy to be working on it. Well, that, that Ms. Walker? I was also going to state the same thing. I don't know if we we need or want four people working on it, but I would also be happy to work on that. Well, well, given the load that's coming my way as chair, I, I think we'd probably be best off having two folks work on it, um, and those two folks can can guide us with their, whatever information we need to to look at and get feedback to them in a, a short turnaround. So if, if that's working well, you know, Mr. Vernon Jones and, and Ms. Owen, are you willing to work on this together? Yeah. Yes. I am. I assume we're talking about both a motion right. and a somewhat more detailed draft report. It's exactly. This the motion and the draft report so that we can have that ready on um, the 21st. Oh, wait. So Ms. Ferreira. But I guess what does, I, I thought Mr. Bachman said he needed was a motion. So mm -hmm. I don't know why we're, you all oh, would give you yourself say, yeah. more work. <laughs> <laughs> yes. he, needs his, his, the, he needs a detailed motion by the 21st. So the motion should have what our recommendations are for the budget, right? What's gonna have budget implications. He doesn't need the, 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 uh, the report yet. That's gonna be on May 15th. So I think we wanna just be focused, right? And, and you all could work on, on, on a, a draft motion with our recommendations so that we can review that on the 21st and, and discuss it and- I think that's what we're it. asking. Maybe it's not well articulated, but is that accurate, Ms. Mr. Mr. Bachman? Yes. Um, yeah, that's, that's it, yeah. The motion is what's the key piece. And I, I do think you have the outlines already We decided. do, yeah. yeah. Ms. Pat. So with the motion, are we going to also be um, including what we think the budget will cost, what our proposal is going to cost? Because we can make as much motion as we want if um, we don't put dollar amount into it, then what's the point? Mr. Vernon Jones. Well, I think our responsibility is to recommend the programs uh, that we need, and it's the town manager's job to figure out what it costs. I, I would agree with Mr. Vernon Jones on, on, on that because I think our, our job is to, to put together the substance and the nature of the program so that it, it's well articulated and understood what the needs are and let, let that be the, the weight behind uh, putting a cost to those. Uh, Ms., Ms. Pat and then Ms. Ms. Walker and and then Ms. Ferreira. I mean, no, I'm sorry, Ms. Pat, Ms. Ferreira, and then Ms. Walker. So I hear what Mr. Ross said, and I do appreciate what the town manager has done with the, you know, with what you sent to us. Was it today? Or was it yesterday? I had some questions around that budget, and I look at it. 
I feel that that wouldn't be enough for one year um, first responder or whatever we call it. I feel that, you know, there should be more amount, more than what you have proposed, you, you sent to us, for example. So I, the point I'm trying to make is that we should have some input in whatever you present to us. Um, I just don't want any of the programs to fail. That's my anxiety. And I think I said, Ms. Ferrer, Ms. Walker, I'm not sure about that order. Ms. Yeah. Ferrer? Yeah, for me, just to clarify, I mean, I just, you know, want us to kind of focus on the, the recommendations right now and then, um, you know, be it as deep, you know, kind of be as specific as possible what we're doing, you know, that we want it to be sustainable, we want it to have the right, you know, resources, the comprehensive resources, things like that. But, but like uh, Mr. Wiley was saying, I'll get back down with the budget right now because then we can put our reasoning for those things in our proposal, in our report we have to give later. But right now, I think it's gonna be important to just focus on these are the things that we're recommending and be you know, kind of detailed about what we're recommending and, and making sure that's fully resourced and staff. Just saying those words, right? Fully resourced, staff for whatever we're recommending and sustainable. Ms. Walker. Um, so I also just need a little bit of clarification. I'm, I'm a little bit confused because I, my understanding of it was a little bit opposite because I thought the budget deadline is first before our recommendations are due. And so at the presentation that Mr. Balkman gave to the town council, he did state to them that he was going to be giving them the recommendations for the budget first and that they would then later receive our recommendations that go along with the amount of money he set aside for our work. So I actually, in opposition, believe that we need to have some sort of estimate or rough idea as to how much each recommendation will cost before we even figure out the, the final, exactly how the re recommendations will be set because the budget and the numbers come out first. So we can say we want you know, a, a community responder program. The estimated cost of this is 700K as per Mr. Bockelman's breakdown. Um, and then we go into detail as to what the functioning of that program is later and after. Yeah. Thank so, you, Ms. Walker. So, oh, Ms. Pat, go ahead. I know it's late, you know, for us, but I strongly feel that we should actually address the budget in order for us to make recommendations. I mean, we've, we've gone through all this list. I think we should have a subcommittee and I'm willing to volunteer Maybe if somebody else wants to work with me, something very rough so that we, ha we have idea of what we're talking about because we can make as many recommendations as we want. And if the town council or town manager say we're not going to fund it, then what is the point of even making any recommendation if they're not going to fund um, the, the, uh, the different projects? So I think it's very critical that we know how much we're talking about to start some of these programs. And I'm talking about the youth program. I'm talking about the cultural center. I'm talking about um, the uh, inclusion officer and so on. I think it's very clear that we, we come up with dollar amount. I feel, I feel strongly about it. Here's, my, here's a question related to that. Then I'll, I'll go to you, Ms. Pereira, then Ms. Walker. My, my question about that is if we're, we're asking um, uh, Mr. Vernon Jones and Ms. Owen to come up with um, with an outline for what it is we're trying to put forward and we are able to articulate that um, in a way to Mr. Bachelman and maybe this is a side question to you Mr. Bachelman does that inform by its very nature the, the cost of what this may be we can put some costs to it you know and, and estimates but would the description of the program and the nature and substance of the program be enough to um, to establish some um, budget guidelines for you? Yes. So that that's where I'm going. I, I think it's part part of being able to articulate that rather than us put numbers on it, we put substance on it and and see where it, it goes. Um, Mr. Vernon Jones and I think Ms. Ms. Ferreira. Ms. Ferrer and Mr. Vernon Jones, I think it was that way. Uh, Ms. Walker has her hand up. Oh, gee. Ms. Walker, I'm sorry. Too. Yeah, it's hard to see all the screens. Maybe yeah. she needed to lower it. I don't know. Ms. Walker? 
Um, hi, yeah, sorry. Um, so I actually think I disagree and I think it would be in our best interest as a group to present budget estimates at least because although Mr. Balkaman states that with that information he would be able to come up with recommendations, I do also like he sits in all of our meetings and stated at our last meeting that he has no idea what a bud what we're looking at and what a budget like that would would entail and um the town council also in their last meeting were, was very surprised at the amount of money we spent on consultants and so that is also very indicating to me that they are not anticipating the amount of money that we are really going to be asking for and so i think it is critical for us to be realistic with the numbers because they're not anticipating it. Like I can already tell you by the responses that I have res that I have seen widely by the town manager and the town council that they are not anticipating this costing a lot of money. And I think in order to avoid them nickel and diming us that we should put vague, at least they don't need to be very specific, but vague at least estimates of what this would cost to be fully supported because I don't even think they understand what it means to fully support our community. So for to us, for us to expect for them to come up with those answers themselves is very unrealistic. I'm gonna take uh, two comments, three comments. I'm gonna end with Mr. Vernon Jones, Ms. Ferreira, Ms. Owen, and Mr. Vernon Jones. And then I, I'd like for us to, to settle on a, on a charge for the people who are gonna be working on this um, and allow them to do their work. If they wanna you know, consider what we're putting forward about budget, fine. If, if not, I think they should be able to have the opportunity to get something to us and have us comment on it. Ms. Ferreira? Yeah, I mean, I, I hear Ms. Walker. I mean, I don't want to, you know, you know, disqualify or anything like that. It's just that obviously we're at the 11th hour, right, at, at this point. So I guess my thing is, what is it that we're going to need? And maybe we need to hear from Mr. Bachman again, because I guess I'm confused at this point, too, in terms of things, because we also can't rush this. We can't, we can't, for me at, at this point, unless this, uh, this subcommittee is gonna say, they're gonna be able to kind of look up, right? How, what each program is gonna cost between now and then, which, hey, if they have the willpower and the energy to do it and the wherewithal, go at it, you know? But, we, you know, we're, we're at a point where we have to give something on the 21st, you know? Exactly. So, so that's the thing, but, you know, I, obviously I want to be most effective. So I hear Ms. Walker, what, what she's saying. So I guess I need to hear from Mr. Bachman again to, to find out, but those are my, my, before I can make a decision, ultimate decision, though, that, that's my concern. So let me go to, to uh, Ms. Owen and, and then Mr. Vernon Jones, and then Mr. Bachman, if you, you feel the need to make a comment at the end, I'd like to move this forward. Ms. Owen. Uh I just want to echo what Ms. Walker said about the town council thinking that we spent too much money on our consultants. I'm wondering if it's us overstepping to maybe ask um, our consultants to help me and Mr. Vernon Jones help budget these programs because they're doing research on them. Um, so that way we can turn in a realistic budget because I think even just looking back at what Mr. Bachelman turned in that um, if we want fully resourced experienced staff, it might be a little bit more. And I think maybe the consultants could help, but I just don't want to overstep. Mr. Vernon Jones and then I'm going to Mr. Bachelman and I'd like to sum this up, please. Well, what Mr. Bachelman when Mr. Bachman sent us this, he invited us to identify anything he might have missed or places where we saw it differently. And uh, I'm not inclined to try to take over the, the role of ascertaining the cost of things, but I think all of us who think something has been underestimated in Mr. Bachman's budget uh, for the CREST program should write to him uh, immediately with our suggestions and our amounts and we can't and CC the rest of the group. We can't then comment on each other's uh, emails, but we can all let him know if we think, you know, more money is needed or need, need to be budgeted at more experienced people. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not interested in our trying to do our own cost estimates, things like pensions and health benefits and, and all of that. So, uh, Mr. Bachman, I, I don't, unless there's a question, I don't have anything to add to this. Okay. Um, okay. There's a couple more, three more comments. People, we have to, I want to be sure we, we move this forward very quickly. We have to give 
our uh, Mr. Vernon Jones and, and Ms. Owen an opportunity to work with this. Uh, please make these comments brief. No, Mr. Wiley, what yeah. I was saying is that I do have that question. Like I had posed that question to Mr. Bachman because I just want him to rest to restate. You know, is it beneficial to 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 give the budget? You know, along with our our the the motion that that is going to be written, we're going to state our recommendations. That's going to have budget implications. Is it important that we also state how much each of those things are going to cost? I, I, I think I asked this a, a moment ago and I, and I said, what would, what would be most useful for us to articulate the nature and substance of these, this proposal, tell us what it is we need. And then, you know, so this is what we're saying. And, and then he's gonna say, this is what this costs. And, and I think my, the answer I got was it, rather than put num numbers to it, we put substance to it and then apply the numbers. That, that was my understanding. I don't know if that's different than what you're saying, Mr. Bachman. No, well, I think we have a set of numbers on the table that has been shared. If, if there are different numbers that need to come out, I think, I think you've identified a lot of things. Um, some don't have numbers, some do, the CREST program does. That's what we, there's most attention okay. has been given. So if that number has to be changed and, um, so the the recommend the vote next week is about what you want, what's most relevant to the FY22 budget. Um, you can add things and do things in your report, of course, because it's going to have more context and support from the, the working group. So, Ms. Pat, you had your hand up, and then Ms. Walker. Okay, this is going to blow back on us that I will support. Whatever the majority is saying is late. Everybody's tired. It's been a hard week for everybody. So Beth, I just have this feeling that our, our time is going to be wasted. I have this gut feeling that when it's presented to the town council, there will be, we don't have the money. So the sooner we know, if we start throwing money, you know, budget around, then then we go from there, but whatever we decide tonight, I respect it because the group majority carries. So I respect that. I'm, I'm getting pushed back, but hmm. we're doing it the other way around, backwards, I think. I'm not interested in, in presenting something when we don't even know if the town council or town manager is going to support the budget. I think my, my comment on that, Ms. Ms. Petter, is I, you know, I, I understand the, it's, Certainly, and and feel that's that sentiment. Not absolutely. I I strongly believe that um, you know we have an opportunity to make a statement here, and it's not necessarily not necessarily, although ultimately it is about dollars, but it's really about substance. And I think my my sentiment around that is a lot of stuff that's been been proposed in this town and other towns and cities is, is not substantive in a way that's compelling for people to, to believe that it's true. I think our job is to compel the town manager to see this as something that we value. It's something that we were asked to do. We were called to do this job. We're, we're, we're doing it. And, uh, you know, if if at some point, you know, we, we feel like, you know, over the next few days, we want to throw some numbers at it, that's fine. But I think if you articulate what, what, what it requires to do this, the numbers follow. And the, those numbers that, were, that we've seen earlier, um, you know, will change. Will change if, if what we say needs to be done, needs to be done. And, you know, it, it could go from, X to Y to Z, uh, but we, we've got to be able to say what is needed. And I, I fully respect and understand what you're saying. I, I have some of those doubts myself. So it's not, it's not like I'm, I'm there. Uh, Ms. Walker. Um, thank you. So I, I hear everybody and I, I respect and value everybody's input. I agree with Ms. Ferreira that our, our work is time sensitive and that makes it a little bit more difficult, but for that reason is exactly why I also think it's important for us to put the budget because 
for example, if we give our recommendations next week on the 21st and then wait for Mr. Balkelman to come back with the budget estimates that they come up with, we then don't have any time to make any recommendations to change anything that he comes up with. But if we set the precedent and give him our own rough estimates, then he there then has something to work off of since we don't have time to correspond again thereafter. Um, and also I, I, I hear Mr. Wiley saying that it should be done with substantive Sub substantive information about the program and then get the numbers. And I also agree with that. However, I still need Mr. Balkelman to clarify after I'm done speaking. It was my understanding that that's not how this is going to work because of the fact that they moved the budget date back and that they are going to get the outline, the budget with the numbers before they get our written report with the information in it. And I think that piece of information is critical to the way we move forward, because if they were getting the explanation of the programs before the budget, I think that we would be able to have a different approach. And I and I do understand that this conversation is getting really late and we have to sign off, but Ms. Pat did say that she would be happy to work with somebody else to look at this and I would be happy to work with Ms. Pat to look at there these because I, I think it's I think it's very important. I think it's critical and I don't think it can hurt us at all to include it in the data, but I think it, it could possibly hurt us if we don't. I'd like to 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 go to uh, and with all due respect to everyone in, in the time we're on, uh, Ms. Ms. Owen and, and Mr. Vernon Jones uh, agreed to begin working on this. What would be most helpful from this committee for you all to begin this process, and how could we, uh, as a as a working group, engage in this process as you're doing your work, Mr. Vernon Jones? Well, given what's just been said, I would propose that. Ms. Owen and I develop a motion that describes the program and its features. Uh, and uh, we, we plan to vote that motion, uh, but that uh, Ms. Pat and uh, Ms. Walker go ahead and work on some, some numbers and costs and we can submit those to the town manager at the same time. I don't see them as part of the motion necessarily, but I, you know, I mean, we may decide to vote those numbers too, but, um, I, I think you know we, we need the motion to describe the program and if folks are able to work on some numbers to go with it, uh, that could be part of what we submit to the town manager next week. Ms. Ferrer. Yeah, and I just wanna say to be clear, it was good to get all this um, for the discussion. And, and when I heard Mr. Bachman speak again, I was swayed. So Ms. Walker, you swayed me. And I, I do think the budget needs to be included. Okay, so so let me let me respond to that. So, Mr. Vernon Jones and and Miss Miss Owen will work toward uh, bringing something forward in the form of a motion. Miss Miss Pat and Miss Walker, did I get that right? Mm -hmm. Be willing to examine and explore the uh, the budgetary implications for what would be going forward. And so, let me ask the two of you as well. What would you need from this group? What would you need from our group as a whole to help inform your work? Ms. Pat. So basically, and I can't speak for um, Ms. Walker. So I'm thinking with the programs that we identified tonight, you know, we'll start, you know, putting dollar amounts to them and then present it next week. Or maybe work with um, Mr. Uh, uh, Ross and um, Ms. Zoe, uh, Ms. Owen. But then could the, could something the, like that, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to sorry speak to over you. Oh, That's okay. Sorry, my so, raised hand button kind of disappeared. Is it okay if I pop Yeah, in? go ahead, Ms. Walker. So, um, so I agree with Ms. Pat. I think the only, th the things that would be most helpful would be if we have, I mean, we already have the template that we have of all of our suggestions that we came up with together would be helpful. So we can just put numbers to every suggestion that we already have from our group. Um, and then it, I don't know what Mr. Vernon Jones and Ms. Owens timeline would be, but if they're able to complete their motion and send it to us, we can just look at what their motion is and what they're recommending and put numbers to those things. And that's the, the, the next, question I had in terms of getting getting this in motion and us being supported as a group to the four people who are working on this right now. We, we need to have this information in front of the whole group 
I think in time for us to, to, to take a look at it, to absorb it, to see if we have any other final comments or, or contributions. So I, I, I would yield to uh, Ms. Owen and Mr. Vernon Jones and uh, Ms. Pat and Ms. Walker to, to say, you know, my question is, can you, can you have that to us, for example, by Tuesday morning? Or earlier? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. 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 Was that a yes or the earlier? No, Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> Tuesday morning? I think Tuesday. Okay, if you can give that to Tuesday morning, let's say 10 o'clock maybe. Um, and we can get that uh, in the loop to Ms. Moyston. And then all of us, I would in, in, encourage us to respond a, as a group. I would expect everyone to have a comment on that. Careful. Wait. So uh -huh. do you want us to just send it back to Ms. Moyston? Ms. Moyston. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Not not to <laughs> don't send it to, to Mr. Bachelman. You don't want to hear this. So it's like you send send it to Ms. Moyston as we usually do, folks. Of course. But uh, don't be out of the loop uh, in terms of making comments. All good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you all for this. Um, Ms. Owen, Mr. Vernon Jones, Ms. Pat, Ms. Walker, thank everybody for your, your comments and your extra work on this. And we'll keep moving forward. I, I would like to, um, in, in the interest of, of time, we are very late. We're, we're I'm speaking for everybody saying that we're a little tired. Um, I would like to um, just very quickly see if, if there are any um, upcoming events that you um, state them quickly. And if not, you're thinking about something, just email it to Ms. Moisten and you can circulate that. Um, let's go quickly forward, Ms. Owen. Um, I saw that the Human Rights Commission is meeting next Thursday and that um, sort of an update on where a group is is on their agenda. In addition to a draft of support against police, police brutality to BIPOC communities, I'm going to try my best to make it, but I think that we should all try to make an effort to go. And I think for the second part of our charge on police oversight, maybe we could work in collaboration with the Human Rights Commission. The meeting's this Thursday. Oh, it's this yeah, Thursday? It's tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, yikes. Yeah, it okay. is. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that. If if there are no others, with our next meeting is going to be next Wednesday at five thirty. Oh, Mr. Vernon Jones, I'm sorry. Well, this is not. A, this is. I'm afraid this is going to be an unpopular comment, but um, I think it's very important that we not only have good recommendations, but we also have credibility with the public and with the town council. And we made a commitment that we were going to meet with the chief of police uh, for at least part of our meeting next week. Uh, and I feel very strongly that we need to keep that commitment that for us to have credibility with the town, we can't do all our work and then talk to the police. We have to talk to the police and hear from them uh, before we finish our work. I agree. I, 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 I left that up, up, up in the air based on what uh, certainly Scott Livingstone said. He's available at any time, given preference to the work we have to do, certainly uh, on, on press and other things. And, you know, we're behind on that. And that's part of the part of our part, part of our issue. If the group would like to have um, uh, Scott Livingstone and his staff, as, as he talked about it earlier, come and present to us, then I can you know, certainly extend that invitation on behalf of the CSWG. We have to very carefully craft our agenda next time to be sure we have room for, for him and his staff, for our, um, our uh, consultant group, and for uh, the work that um, our four individuals on our committee are doing some. So I'm, I'm all for that. And, you know, if we need to have an extended, you know, we have to extend the meeting beyond that time. I'm certain I would ask uh, Mr. Livingstone if he'd be able to come back another time, but we can start that next meeting if that's something that the, the committee would like to see. 
thumbs up to invite uh, Mr. Livingstone. Ms. Walker, Ms. Bowman, can't see a thumbs up there, but I could yeah. hear a voice maybe that would be helpful. Yeah, sorry, I can't find my raise hand button. Okay, that's okay. Thank you. So I, I will work on inviting um, uh, Mr. Livingstone. Also, there's a there's a proposal on what that discussion might look like, which I sent out earlier to folks um, several meetings ago. I'll resend it again. It's about the structure of that that meeting time frame. It might have to be modified a bit, but um, I'll send it out for you to comment on as well, Miss Walker. I mean, Miss Ferreira. Um, I guess you know, since if we're going to be meeting, talking about our recommendations and meeting with the chief, I would I would suggest kind of just saying to the consultants next week just to send a, a report for us because mm -hmm. I don't see us having all of that. Unless you're going to extend, unless you you want to extend the meeting right now and say we're going to be meeting for four hours, so that I'm ready. <laughs> we're no, going to be meeting no. for four no. hours, because I think you know, because if not, what we're doing is just we we continue to like go over by an hour or two, and I think we know that it's not going to work. You see, what I'm saying that three things, unless like I said, we're extending it by three of you know two Great hours. Great suggestion, thank you, uh, Ms. Ferrer. And no, I'm not not into four hours. I, <laughs> I like you, but not like like that. I, it's like, so I, I could request that of um, uh, uh, Dr. Shabazz and uh, Seven Generations. And with that, that, that comment, please um, send me, if you will, through Ms. Moyston, anything you want to be sure that their written report for us next week uh, is included. So that will make sure that they're responding to some of your questions and concerns, if that's okay. Um, all good. So next next week, uh, five thirty, let's get our agenda items, which are already in pretty much in place. Um, will be um, uh, Scott Livingstone, um, and um, the the work we're continuing to do with our our subcommittees on the on the budget and the proposal. So those will be our two things. Thank you. Um, I'm assuming there's no other topics because we've probably exhausted every topic there is to be said at this moment. And if not, I'd like to, to entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Ms. Pat. And a second? I second that. Thank you, Ms. Owen. Uh, thank you all for the meeting it is uh we're now adjourning at 8 32 p.m thank you for all your hard work and we'll continue going forward we're making progress brianna before thank you leave you. could you give me your phone number yeah of course thank you all and i have yes walker right okay good night everyone oh. good night miss pat good night everyone good night miss pat good night Okay, um, so my phone number is 413. 413-230-0707. Stop, stop. No. Mm -hmm. oh. oh, it's recording. Well, it's not so much that it's recording that it's attendees. I kind of thought that perhaps you would share it through the chat. Oh, we don't have chat. Don't I have can it just send it to you because I have it. Oh, okay. okay. And would you okay. send Zoe in my number too? I sure will. That will oh. too. That's great. I, okay. I didn't realize I was on mute. I'm sorry. I kept trying to like, I was like, wait, how come they're not hearing me? Okay. Yeah, no, we don't have a chat. It's a... Yeah. All okay. right. We'll send that Thank to you. Us. And Brianna, let's, let's see if we can do this sooner rather than I, later. Definitely. Great. Okay. Right. Good night. Good night. Bye. Oh, Miss Moyston, I just had uh, one mm -hmm. thing. I'm going to try my best to be at the Human Rights Commission. I thought it was next Thursday for some reason. I can I can try to come to tomorrow, but I just have a Zoom that goes from 6 to 7, so I just might be a little bit late. Oh, that's okay. I can, okay. yeah, yep. All okay. right. Thank you so much. Okay, bye. Oh, <laughs> have a good bye. night.